welcome to the San Jose Hockey Now podcast. I'm Shang Peng, editor in chief of San Jose Hockey Now. Also, you can find my work at NBC Sharks. Also, I'm on Twitter, Shang underscore Peng. And I'm Keegan McNally. You can find me on Twitter at halfwall underscore hockey or at my website, half dash wallhockey.com or at San Jose Hockey Now. And uh, this week on the San Jose Hockey Now podcast, in the wake of the Eric Carlson trade, we wanted to get your thoughts and questions in our first ever subscriber mailbag. Uh, we have so many amazing questions, like a lot of questions um, from everyone that we're going to get to um, from prospects to training camp to roster talk to Carlson talk and pretty much everything else in between. We also have a really special guest, Sharks captain and new father, Logan Couture, on the podcast. He talks about how the Sharks move on without Eric Carlson. We shot, we swap uh, funny Eric Carlson stories and he pours cold water on the rumored Eric Carlson, Brent Burns rift. We also look back at the great what if in the Sharks Carlson era, if Carlson had stayed healthy in the 2019 playoffs. And we talk about Logan Couture's future with the Sharks. But first, uh, we're going to be going through uh, all of your questions. I think the best way to put it is that we're going to do probably one question from each person, just because some people had multiple, multiple questions. Yeah, so not all of your questions. So yeah, don't, not uh, all of them. Don't advertise. Gonna, <laughs> we, we can't we're gonna deliver. pick out one from every subscriber that, that commented. And if next time uh, you guys, uh, we do this again, you guys can comment on the article and we'll read your questions, but let's get into it. Cause there's a lot of questions. So we'll start right away. Um, this one comes from Stina or S T I N A one, one, seven. Um, is it possible that the addition of Hoffman might mess up some locker room chemistry considering his hit on Couture or what happened with Carlson's family? This is some deep cuts about uh, Hoffman and Carlson and in even a um, Couture hit from 2016. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, that hit was a while ago. So I would think that that's a little, you know, water under the bridge. Um we actually, in our uh, conversation with uh, with Logan coming up, he actually talked about uh, talking to former teammates about some of the new guys coming in. He mentioned uh, Kunin and Granlin played together. And he mentioned uh, Chris Tierney, a Sharks fan favorite, uh, played <laughs> with Hoffman in Montreal. And Couture said that uh, Tierney said uh, Tierney. Uh, uh, mentioned that or said that Hoffman's a cool guy. So um, I don't really see any uh, any kind of major issue. And I know that the stuff with um, uh, uh, Carlson's family, uh, his wife, Melinda, and uh, Hoffman's uh, uh, fiance, now wife, uh, um, you know, that that was, um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a big story a number of years ago. But I don't really foresee anybody in the Sharks room, quote unquote, you know, taking sides, you know, because that happened so long ago and, you know, who's right, who's wrong in it. And I don't think that that would enter into the conversation for the Sharks, at least. Yeah, it, it didn't seem like when we asked, you guys are here soon, we asked Couture about it, that he didn't seem too concerned. And I think in general, like one bad hit from seven, eight years ago, most of the time for hockey players isn't going to stick unless it's something that, you know, permanently injures someone or it's like a predatory behavior that yeah, keeps it, on going. It's not like Hoffman is like a, yeah. a guy like that, targeting guys all the time or whatever. Yeah, I mean, bad hits happen. But it's like, I think the players get reputations if they continually do bad hits, but one bad hit isn't going to make or break someone's reputation most times unless something serious happens. So. Uh, but very good question. Um, there's another question that Stina had that we're going to get to in other people's questions. So Stina, if you're listening, um, your other question will be answered in other iterations. <laughs> um, next one comes from uh, Jiggles. Um, basically, uh, do you think the emphasis on minimal retention in the Eric Carlson trade was driven more by Hasso? There was reports out that Hasso, it's Hasso's money after, after all kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or Greer, um, was more of the driving factor between the minimal retention number or were the two factors equal? Well, I don't know for sure. Uh, but my, my thought is that it's a little bit of both. You know, I don't think Greer gets the Sharks job if he's telling Hasso that he wants a total teardown because I don't think that's what Hasso wanted. Um, but 
Greer has also re- ha- has shown that he's realistic enough to 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 know that the Sharks have to go through some kind of rebuild here. You know, obviously trading Timo Meyer, uh, trading Eric Carlson, these are moves of somebody that recognizes that the Sharks need to kind of go through some kind of rebuild to kind of uh, try to get themselves back in place. That they weren't going to uh, win with uh, with yep. uh, uh, a team built around Meyer and Carlson. Yeah, it's. It's easy to forget, but we've had all of these really good players all on the same team at the same time, and we still have been bottom ten and bottom five to ten in the standings for four years. Like Carlson, Meyer, you know, Burns, Hurdle, Couture, Kane, Jones, like players that were long term contracts, and the Sharks were still bad. And I think at some point, probably Hasso and Greer took a look at it and said, okay, we really need to move on from this previous core that wasn't winning. And I think the minimal retention number is basically a way of putting a flag in the sand and saying like the past regime is kind of done. Like we still have Couture and Hurdle as like veteran guys, but we needed to move on. We couldn't be looking back at, you know, four years from now and still be retaining half on Carlson. It just didn't, to me, it didn't feel right. That was always my argument, though, about the rebuild. I don't know what what you think about that, too, Shane. Um. Well, uh, I mean, I I think that that is like you mentioned, sort of the the line in the sand of uh, you know twenty five twenty six. Um, you know, uh, we have all this cap space. I think a question is, you know, I don't know if we can uh, judge the Eric Carlson trade until we know what they do with the cap space they've created. Um, if all they do is take on bad contracts and get draft picks, well, that may not be a bad thing. So that's one way to judge it. Uh, if they make a, you know, they, if they make a move uh, two, three years from now for the, you know, the Jack Eichel of, 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 of that time, you know, the guy who wants out, who is young, uh, who fits kind of in the long-term profile of the Sharks, right? And they make a move for that guy. That's another way to judge it too, right? If they do nothing with it, the cap space just kind of sits there, then that's another way to judge it. So, you know, what was the point of, uh, of, uh, of saving Hassel that money if, yeah. if uh, you know, we could have, you know, got the Sharks could have got uh, decent draft picks, but at back at least for retaining more. So, so anyway, so we'll we'll see on that. Yeah, or if they sign like the Milan Lucic sure. of the two years from now, and like, <laughs> why did you sign? Well, let's a let's hope not. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm yeah, but it's like if they're gonna go for this kind of quick turnaround thing where they try and sign a bunch of free agents that aren't really worth it, then that would be a waste. But yeah. hopefully that's not the direction the Sharks are going in. Let's see. Okay, next question is from uh, James R. Uh, it's kind of a longer question, but it, it basically boils down to how would you evaluate Nabby's Nabokov's work as director of goaltending? The stats of Reimer, Kakin, and Hill tell one story, which is mostly a bad one. Is it a case of the aforementioned goalies not having the skills, horrible team defense, combination of the two, or something else entirely? Uh, if it's all of them, why? Lastly, which goalie prospects are showing promise? This is basically a big old state of the state of the Sharks yeah. goalie union address, state of the union address for Sharks goalies. Well, yeah. So it, the answer to the, the the first part of it, you know, is are the goalies bad? Is it a horrible team defense or both? It's always both, right? Um, you know, if you put in a prime era Dominic Hasek behind the Sharks defense, I think prime era Dominic Hasek could figure it out. <laughs> he, <laughs> he played behind a lot of uh, average to not so good teams too. Uh, but none of these guys are, you know, Dominic Hasek and no one is expecting them to be that. Um, so anyway, so I think it's a combination of both that. Uh, in terms of uh, Nabokov and sort of the, the work that he's been doing in development, um, I know that this will come across as a as a kind of a defense, but uh, but look at, okay, look at Warren Stralo, the great Warren Stralo, uh, Sharks goaltending coach from 1991, I believe, to 2007. Um, guys like Nabokov, Kiprasov, uh, Toskala were all uh, uh not drafted by him, but, you know, he had a, a big hand in their development, right? And he should be in the Hall of Fame. He's legendary. You know, everything that, that Warren Stralo touches in gold is gold, except that it isn't. And I'm going to read off some names here, and it's not to... It's not to uh, to to attack Stralo in any sort of way. It's just to it's just to to say that it's hard to hit on a on any prospect in a draft, you know, goalie or otherwise. So here's some names here though: Cohen Sardiv, Dan Ryder, Chris Burns, Jeff Sal Salyoko. Some names I don't even know how to say. Uh, uh, Jonas Forsberg, 
Evgeny uh, Nabokov, Mika Kiprasov, Vesa Toskala, uh, Michelle LaRock, Terry Friesen, Nolan Schaefer, Dimitri Padzoid. Ooh, uh, Sharks Patrick, legend, Nolan, yes, uh, Nolan Schaefer. <laughs> seven games in NHL. Patrick yeah. uh, uh, Elechner, uh, Brian Mahoney Wilson, Derek McIntyre, Jason Churchill, Thomas Grice. Uh, Taylor Dackers, Alex Stalock, uh, Tyson Sexsmith, and Timo, uh, not Timo Meyer, but Timo Peel Meyer. <laughs> anyway, so I, I count just, like five goaltenders in there and then nothing. Right. And, you know, this yeah. is like, what is this? This is like 20 goalies the Sharks have drafted in, in Stralo's tenure, right? Uh, there's five guys uh, who have had a significant NHL impact. Nabokov, Kiprasov, Toskala, Grice, and Stalock. Really only two guys here, right, that you would say were legit number one guys in the NHL for any period of time. I know Toskala had a you know nice year as a backup. Grice had nice sure. years as sort of a 1A, 1B, right? But only two guys that you really want to go to war with in the playoffs, right? Probably Nabokov or Kiprasov, right? And so this is in, uh, this is in uh, what is it, uh, uh, 16, 16 years. Um, so, you know, two big hits and five, you know, five, five good hits in general and two big hits. So it's really tough to... And again, this is not to 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 attack Stralo, but it's tough to find a guy. You know, you you take a lot of chances. You have a lot of you you have a lot of failures. Uh, so what I will say about Nabokov is that I have heard stuff about you know some questions about whether or not Nabokov is modern enough, up to date. But then I've heard pushback on that that pushback on that that he indeed is. So I don't have a clear sense of that part of it. I'm just relaying that. Uh, questions I've heard, and then the pushback to it. Uh, but I would say though that the Bokov does need a a hit, <laughs> so we can agree on that, right? Because it has been a few years. The Sharks have been flip flopping, you know, going through goalies uh, uh, like uh, you know, like like cheap cigarettes. Uh, I, I've said before they've been doing that the last few years. They need they need they need a hit on somebody eventually, be it somebody that they trade for or somebody that they uh, they draft and develop. Um, so I'm not I'm not saying uh, so I'm not saying that uh, you know Nabokov gets the long leash forever to figure this out, but though um, you know I think he's been sort of the director. You know he's had more of a, a hand the last three years or so I believe, right? Uh, maybe four. So I think he deserves a couple more years to see if he can kind of figure out you know uh, get that guy that will sort of I guess save his reputation in a way. Yeah, it's like you said. The- goaltenders are tough and the like some of the like pros and cons of this is Reimer had like a, an amazing season two years ago behind the Sharks team that was really bad I mean Bugner is, is pretty defensive oriented so he had a good you know, season I want to call it amazing yeah <laughs> amazing is amazing in terms of uh better than the Sharks have used to for sure like, sure yeah years. what's hilarious about that is uh you yeah. think evolving evolving hockey's uh goal mm-hmm. saved above expected I think that uh, Reimer is the only goalie in the last five years, that had a uh, a, a positive goal saved above expected. Only this is the bar. Year, <laughs> only twenty one, twenty two, and not a lot more than expected. He wasn't a a top top goalie, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was for the Sharks. That was a pretty good year. So but I think Aaron Dell had guess... had a straight positive, uh, mm-hmm. or no, I'm sorry, a straight like zero point two or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but what <laughs> is more point. likely? Is it is it more likely that Nabokov is the influence here and like? For some reason, Reimer had a good year two years ago and then a bad year last year or or whatever. Also with Aiden Hill, where he had it was pretty poor in San Jose and then went and won a Stanley Cup, like proved that he could be a Stanley Cup winning goaltender behind it, obviously stacked defense. But like what's more likely that for some reason Evgeny Nabokov's influence somehow made them bad here and good somewhere else, or bad one year, good another year, right. or the Sharks were just bad. And the Sharks being bad all of this time makes goaltenders' numbers look a lot worse. And yeah. in some ways, they were kind of validated by, by targeting Hill because he's, you know, he's kind of what NHL teams want nowadays, which is like a big system goaltender who doesn't, you know, doesn't have a huge cap hit on your sheet, um, but can still be put in for 40 to 50 games, maybe with another big system goaltender, and then can like walk you through a playoff series. That's kind of what. NHL teams want it seems 
And I think in some ways they were validated by trading for him. Obviously they had to let him go because they, they weren't getting the Aiden Hill they thought they were going to get from him. But I think at the end of the day, I don't think Nabokov has had an amazing tenure as a director of goaltending, but I, I don't think it's his fault. I think honestly, the Sharks are just bad. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't call. I mean, I, it's not. It hasn't been a good tenure, but yeah. uh, it's hard to say who is to blame exactly for that. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I think uh, you bring up some, uh, some, some really good points. Look, like Nabokov. Okay, he's not a miracle worker. You know, do yeah. you want to fire a guy for, for that because <laughs> there are very few kind of miracle workers out there, if, if any. So. Yeah, and I think you know. People will point also, oh, Ben Goudreau went back to the draft. I don't think Nabokov had anything to do with that either. I mean, that's like, one guy, though. You know, I, I just listed all those names that were no. uh, drafted under, you know, Stralo's yeah. tenure. Right? Guy, you know, prospects fail all the time. Even guys 100%. who are relatively high picks, you know, like um, Ben Goudreau, third round pick uh, on that list of the Sharks prospects. I think Terry Friesen was one guy that he's the highest Sharks pick ever uh, for a goalie, uh, 50, the 55th pick, right? And he, you know, he, he, he bombed too. Uh, mm-hmm. Timo Pio Meyer, my favorite name there, uh, uh, was the 83rd pick of the 2007 yep. draft, which is about where, um, where, uh, where, uh, where, where Gaudreau went. And so, you know, guys, uh, guys bomb all the time. Doesn't matter if you have Warren Stralo, once again, a guy who I believe firmly should be in the Hall of Fame. So, yeah. but you're not, you're yeah, not it's, on everybody. I think Nabokov needs a hit. And I think also yep. it's possible that it's one of Krona, McAniemi, you know, we'll see. We'll see. And that's kind of it. Or, or they'll have to draft one in the future too. But I think they just, they need a hit. They just haven't had it yet. And I don't think we can fully judge Nabokov's tenure based on these awful Sharks teams. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next question here. Um, Chris Gear asks, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing anything wrong. With the Sharks prospect pool growing more promising and fairly quickly, there are obviously scouting reports breaking down various talent levels of players, but who are some of the prospects that ha- have that fire in the belly, in quotes, and give it all on the ice, off the ice, and potential new leaders that are in waiting for the Sharks? Yeah, I think this is a, a, a great question. And so mm-hmm. uh, for me, the guys who stand out, you know, Henry Thrun obviously was the captain of his of his Harvard team. I could see uh, Cardwell Raska being sort of that uh, more of the, the fire in the belly, you know, guys who uh, drag you into the fight uh, types, right? Uh, Nick Chichek, uh, under, I know both Raska and Chichek, you know, they didn't necessarily have great years, but uh, but their leadership qualities or their sort of their uh, willingness to to, you know, stick their nose into things. Right. Uh, that's talking specifically about Raska. You know, that can't be questioned. You know, the uh, when he came up, there, there are favorable comparisons to Mario Ferraro. And uh, lastly, a guy that uh, I think people don't necessarily expect. I think uh, my, my my feeling is that he has developed as sort of a young leader of the Sharks is Willie Mecklen. I think that's that's a really good one. It's it's because Eklund kind of I won't say like embodies, but he's you know, he's been pretty resilient, right? Like he's had to, you know, he started with the Sharks, had to go back to mm-hmm. Sweden, he had to come back, adjust to North American ice again, and then he got injured. He played in the, like he's just kind of a resilient prospect. He's also extremely skilled, and players that generally are your best players sometimes also become your assistant or alternate captains and your your captains right like he also not, seems you know uh yeah. in my observation just just likable kind of and so yeah. so guys in the room gravitate toward him and obviously he is the top pick and he does project to be an important member of the sharks so that probably gives them some cachet too or gravitas but uh but um yeah i i, I think though that he he seems like somebody that, again, that, that I, I, I think people will gravitate toward. And so I'm not saying that he will be the captain of the Sharks necessarily, but but sure. I do see leadership qualities in him. Yeah, and I mean, the other one to, to think about is also somebody like Will Smith, right? Where we don't know, but obviously if he sure. goes back to to college and he starts to get a bigger role there and he takes on that, like, I'm the best player on this team kind of thing, maybe in two, three years when he comes to the Sharks, that kind of thing, um, you know, carries over. Like he's a mm-hmm. big time player and big time players often. He also seems like a guy who's very competitive, just talking with him. Um, so could also be a potential new leader, best player, or one of the better prospects. And 
Um, seems like a competitive guy. Other other um, prospects to mention: um, Larock and Co. Uh, Gannon Larock and Brandon Co. wore letters while they were in juniors. Yeah, Larock was captain actually uh, last year for Victoria, even though he only played five yeah. games. It was the summer of Larock last year. That was the uh, quote from a couple of people on Twitter. But um, he didn't. Unfortunately, Gannon didn't have the the type of season where he could actually play a whole lot and, and affect play on ice. But I know that his presence in the Victoria, you know, system was was felt obviously. But um, yeah, so he wore a letter. Brandon Co wore a letter, probably by being one of the older players on his junior teams. Also, one of the highest producers and just you know an, an overall leader there. Um, Lastly, I think two players to mention is Bistat and Havilid. Um, both of them play pretty large roles for Team Sweden. They also figure to play large roles for the uh, Team Sweden World Junior Championship team uh, as well. Uh, Bistat's like steadily creeping up in terms of his depth chart with uh, Linchoping. He's like gone from like third line center to now probably second line center. And I think the way that Bistat plays, he's just a very um, He's a skilled player, obviously, but he's, he's just very responsible as a, as a player that I think in the future could be somebody that could a team could look as a as a leader, basically. Mm. One guy Havlid I forgot to mention, too, uh, mm. is uh, Artem Guryev. Uh, I remember sure. a great story about Guryev when he was drafted, uh, that he was living in Toronto. He was drafted in the COVID year, too, and he would uh, basically drive himself, um, or maybe his dad was with him, like drive himself to, to the to uh the where he was training like it'd be like an hour each way or something like that like every every day and uh he's a guy that um you know not a not 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 a prospect with a lot of fanfare but the sharks did sign him to to his elc uh unlike some of the guys from that class like uh like ben gaudreau and um anyway uh, so he's definitely a guy also he plays that physical in your face kind of style and so you know that fire in the belly um like um i you know, he's the guy that'll drag you into the fight. Also, too, actually, mm-hmm. forgot about him. Uh, Nikita Ahotiuk uh, with the Sharks. Sure. Obviously, they picked up in the Timo Meyer trade. And he's a guy that everyone talks about how he's, you know, old school style. You know, like, you know, if if, if he hits, maybe he's uh, like a Rako Gudas or something like that for the Sharks. Yeah. And it is telling, like you, like you said, that Greer um, signed him, basically, mm-hmm. because it wasn't like, Guriev has had tons of points and right. he was like lighting up the OHL, but it was like uh, he mentioned, you know, just the, the positive qualities about that kind of player, which, you know, big defenseman can skate pretty well and then mm-hmm. just hits like a Mack truck. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, he got some qualities, whereas, you know, other guys like Max McHugh, Liam Gilmartin didn't get contracts right. from that prior regime in the same year. So um, those are a couple of guys uh, I think that uh, we answered for that question. All right, next one. Knowing what you know today, uh, how do you think the Sharks will line up on the... This is from Embrace the Rebuild, sorry. How do you think the Sharks will line up on the opening night? Some questions to consider. Is Eklund on the team? Which line does LeBanc play on? Uh, what about the addition of Jan Ruta? What does that mean for the blue line pairings? Yeah, and so I just actually put out an article uh, on this uh, today uh, on NBC Sharks. You also can find it on San Jose Hockey Now. It's uh, basically what will the opening opening night roster look like. Uh, funny enough, actually, um, uh, Curtis from Mercury News, I guess he had the same idea, so we were working on the same thing. I saw that. He had an article. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a funny coincidence. Uh, Curtis and I don't don't swap swap notes uh, 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 during the off offseason. Uh, but anyway, though, um, so yeah, so I have Eklund on the team. I also have Henry Thrun on the team. Those are the two young guys guys that I have on the team um, opening night uh, my prediction for LeBanc I think I had him on the fourth line actually to start opening night uh, just opening night you know LeBanc obviously he's a he is a skilled playmaker and last year he toggled up from the first line to the fourth line and so I could mm-hmm. see that being his his kind of track this year depending on how the coaching staff thinks that he's playing but uh, for now though I have him starting on on the fourth line and um, and uh, a Rudda, yeah, Rudda definitely. Uh, a, a, I I have uh, you know remember that he's the Sharks have three primary right-handed defensemen: Rudda, Benning, and Kyle Burrows, and they're all guys that um, I think will be on the opening night roster. And so I I would rank them: uh, Rudda, Benning, then um, then then Burrows. That's you know that's my guess. So basically, uh, Rudda on the top pairing, Benning on the second, and. And uh, and uh, and Burroughs at bottom pairing. 
Yeah, I think your article um, outlined it, you know, pretty well. It, it's um, the, the Sharks probably have about 16 forwards or so that could be considered for the opening night roster, plus some prospects. And the guys that can be sent down, I think, based on last year, probably will be sent down. So guys that are two-way or, or eligible um, to not have to go through waivers, uh, waivers exempt, basically. And then... Um, so you think that Eklund and Thrun uh, won't make the team? Uh, those guys are no, going great. So I, I think guys like Bordolo, uh, Mukamadoul, and those oh, sure. guys I think sure. are going to go down. To the I didn't even though. mention them in my Houston. article, please. Yeah, unless yeah. they... I think they, they, they'd like, have to like blow it out of the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think Eklund will make the team based okay. on his progression last year, um, based on his play in the NHL when he actually came up. He looked mm -hmm. like a top six forward, top nine forward at least. Um, and I think that, you know, unless his injury is really sent him back this summer, I think that natural progression is going to continue. And I think he will make the team. Okay. Um, but Thrun... I think Thrun will make the team as well. I think there's going to be a couple of the veteran guys that are either going to get moved or waived. I don't think that... I think McDonald's good for what he does, but I think he could be in the AHL or NHL, and I don't think the organization would really you know, lose too much sleep sure, about sure, it. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas I think they want to have Thrun play in the NHL and get more minutes mm -hmm. to develop, I think. Mm -hmm. A guy like Muka Madulin, I think might be AHL bound just because he no, needs a he's lot more a little, time. He's probably too raw. Yeah. Um, again, yeah. AHL had bound. an amazing summer based on what uh, we watched last year. I mean, that's still a, yeah. you know, a good AHL defenseman, but still there. Yeah. You know, he needs, oh, he okay, needs okay. more time. So yeah. I think he'll be AHL bound. Um, but yeah. And I think you're right. Like there's three right-handed defensemen roots, uh, Benning and Burroughs and, Seems like they're going to line up just like that, or maybe Benning first and and yeah, maybe in the second bearing. Yeah, oh, I want to mention too uh, that uh, 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 interestingly enough, uh, uh, Hotiaka he is not uh, waiver exempt, and so I think that's going to help him because you know I think that the Sharks will want to see him in NHL action before kind of deciding what to do with him. Yeah, it, it kind of creates a little log jam because you've got guys mm -hmm. like the left side, you've got Vlasic, Ferraro, Simic. Uh, or Shimmick, uh, McDonald, Kinesiov, and Ohotiak all yeah. on the on that side, or all in that kind of depth chart area. So there's definitely a log jam, but I th it it always seems like there's more of a problem with it before we get into training camp, and then it kind of just sorts itself out. Right, and injuries, that's what's or happen. whatever. Right, yeah. So yeah, yeah, injuries. We had last year. We had Nudavaro go out in the beginning and right. never came back. So right, <laughs> yeah, it's it'll sort itself out and. Does it mean that some guys are going to play on the Barracuda that maybe theoretically could play in a role in the NHL? Possibly, but I think I also think most of the vets just are better than the prospects at this current time. Doesn't mean they will be in the future, but just for the current time. All right. Next question is from Mike. I um, do you think with all the trades Greer has made in the collection of demon, we were just talking about this. Um, that it's possible that we trade for a power play quarterback type of defenseman. Seems like we have a lot of defensive players now. Could sure. use at least one offensive defense, offensive minded defenseman. Yeah, and I would say uh, probably not on 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 a trade. Um, I just don't think that there's a lot of candidates left. Um, you know, Matt Dumba uh, was a UFA. He was the last guy that has significant recent power play experience. Um, uh, otherwise, um, you know, uh, there's Ethan Bear, but he is out of December with a shoulder injury. Uh, Alex Edler used to be a good power play guy, but that was a good four years ago, and he's 37, and we don't, uh, you know, he he might retire. And so there just aren't any real candidates uh, out there in free agency. In trade, um, there aren't, I mean, if you can think of one, there isn't an obvious uh, 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 defensive sort of uh, power play specialist, you know, out there available. Um, a few months ago or a couple months ago, uh, Daily Faceoff said that St. Louis was trying to get rid of a defenseman, a uh, Colton Pareko, uh, Justin Falk, Nick Letty, or Marco Scandella. Uh, but the problem with those guys is that, well, Pareko is signed forever. Uh, mm -hmm. Falk is signed for three former years. Um, it's both still good players, but you know, not really where the Sharks are at in their sort of um, 
in, in their rebuild, right? To be picking up veterans with, you know, six year contracts or whatever left or 40 years left or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. Those are like, those guys can play in the power play, but anyway, those, so I don't think that really works for the sharks. A guy like Levy's fallen off quite a bit. And also his contracts are 25, 26 and Scandell is a more defensive guy. So anyway, um, I do think the Sharks recognize a need for it. You know, Mike Rear mentioned that, yeah, like that's something that they'll be looking to add in the future, a more offensive defenseman. And clearly, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually a guy like Dumba, I'm actually writing about this. Uh, um, Craig Morgan of, uh, of PHNX Sports reported that uh, the Sharks were in on Dumba. And uh, I know, I've reported this, that the Sharks were in on uh, Eric Gustafson. Mm-hmm. And so I think the Sharks recognize uh, that there's a need here. I mean, even the trade for uh, Leon Gavanka, even though Gavanka is uh, is a long shot, right? Uh, just because you know he's 24, hasn't played an NHL yet, but still, uh, you know that's a that's kind of a long shot bet. Maybe he'll surprise us, right? Maybe the Sharks see something in him that the Jets did not, and we'll see that emerge. So I think the Sharks know that they need to address this, but it just right now it's not really out there uh, in the in the trade UFA market. I think. I kind of agree with you. <laughs> yeah, Unless I mean, there's something that, that left, yeah. there's just nobody left. Unless there's somebody that, you know, you can't even think of right now that somehow becomes in the block. I don't. Yeah. Don't Daily face it. off. Uh, it was in their trade our trade targets article. They mentioned Matt Grizzlick too, but Grizzlick, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that was supposed to be a salary cap casualty, but uh, I think the Bruins are all of a sudden under the salary cap because uh, they had two key retirements. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they're so, they're more looking for trying to find a way. Now to get they're a looking center. at players, probably. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, trying to so. find a center, but yeah, I just I don't see it. I mean, maybe we'll talk about it later. Maybe there's a trade for a forward for a defenseman that we could we could get into, but I don't think. Sure, that... sure, sure. The, the Kevin LeBanc Myers rumor. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into it. Um, all right. Next one is from splash one, one, four, uh, with all the, with all things being equal and you earn. Okay. So let me, let me pare this down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just basically there, the question is, uh, uh, if, if all things are equal, the, the prospect performs as well as the veteran basically, yeah, right. Basically. Uh, who, who should, who should get the job? You wave trade and send down the veteran who has been, uh, uh, recently traded for. I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll take this first. Um, so, sure. um, if, if all things are equal, um, then you have to look at other things, right? Like, uh, yeah, guy who's waiver exempt versus a guy who's not right. So yes. So if it's a Bordalo versus a Luke Cunin, for example, right. And they are exactly the same in camp. Yeah. I could see the veteran getting the nod. Uh, but I think that's okay though, because you don't want to lose, uh, you know, Luke Cunin, I know people don't, uh, uh, don't love his statistical profile or whatnot right a lot of people did not like the trade luke kunin net uh netted national third round pick and i think people will like him talking around uh scouts or whatever his reputation is higher than uh than it shows on you know whatever uh, uh, uh charts or, or or whatever you know he's a guy with uh you know intangibles that people like and and with kind of a, a underrated skill a little bit more scoring than uh than, than than people would expect for him so anyway people people like a guy like that and so the sharks aren't going to wave a luke kunin uh because chances are someone would 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 pick him up and probably so, would. <laughs> Yeah. So any. So anyway. So in in that kind of case where all things are equal, then I then I can see the veteran winning it out. But I think there is the possibility that the Sharks uh, uh, have created the possibility for prospects to take jobs because look at the guys that they've acquired. I mean, these guys are they're all guys that were you know really good to three, four years ago, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's not in some cases, you know, a guy like Mike Hoffman, uh, you know, was last, uh, uh very productive in 2021. Uh, Mikhail Granlin has had a few 60 point seasons, but obviously did not have a good season last year. Uh, Duclair, you know, just down the line, right? Like these, these are all, uh, guys that, yeah, if, if all these veteran guys, if they hit, then that's a good problem to have. And that then the youngsters will be cu- get pushed out. But then you've added, you know, uh, two 30 goal scorers and Hoffman and Duclair. I'm talking about these guys hit. Uh, Granlin is a 60 point guy. He's done that before, right? And yeah. so if these guys hit, right? And if they don't hit, 
which is, you know, obviously not all of them will, or it's not likely to. Uh, these are guys that jobs, they're, 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 they're very takeable. You know, they, yeah. the Sharks didn't add anybody with a $10 million contract for six years. Uh, that's also really good. You know, like no one is taking Eric Carlson's job if, he, if Carlson was still with the Sharks, just either because <laughs> he's both really good and he's also really expensive, right? Uh, but these other guys are, are, are quite replaceable if the guy is good enough. And I, I, I think I mentioned this um, uh, in a story or a comment. Look, like if your prospects can't take the job of 15 goal version of Mike Hoffman, and that's where Mike Hoffman has been the last two years, right? And he is... Uh, you know, he's, he is kind of a one dimensional player, you know, and if, if he, if that if that was all he can do, right. Which is, which is low, right. You expect more from a, from a goal scorer of, of his, uh, of his ilk. If you can't take a job from 15, 15 goal, Mike Hoffman, maybe you're not ready for the NHL. And so, yeah, that's, that's my, that's my overall thought of it. I don't think it's a big deal. I know a lot of people are worried about the youngsters, not, not getting time. I will say this, you know, like, like I, I defend a lot of what, what Doug Wilson did and I can, you know, look back. I don't look back on hindsight. You know, I look back at the time. I think a lot of things were defensible, but, um, I always prefer making guys earn the playing time. And the last couple of years with Doug guys weren't earning their NHL debuts or playing time, at least for, you know, they just weren't that good. You know, and we yeah. see that, you know, because none of them except for Mero Ferraro has carved out any sort of regular career in the NHL. At least I believe so. Yeah. The Kanizhov, maybe if, 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 if he pans out, but like, uh, there's, uh, I've said this stat many times, you know, the last three years under Doug, uh, and the last year, you know, Doug, Joe, Will, the Sharks had 29 NHL debuts, 29, uh, debuts, uh, in those three years. And look at that list. There's a lot of guys who honestly, like they worked hard, et cetera, et cetera, but those weren't NHL guys. Yeah. It kind of felt like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing if it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. Like Absolutely. it felt like guys that were just trying to, you know, like if they got into the right scenario, maybe they'd pop off and then maybe they're NHLers without actually assuring that they're NHL is first before getting to the NHL. And not even close to. Yeah. So yeah, still like, too. And, you know, all that being said, I love Jasper Weatherby to death. He's like one of my favorite prospects, but I, I don't think he was opening night roster kind of kind of guy. But. Yeah, he was on the power play opening night. So, yeah. So, you know, it, it say what you will, but the veterans currently are probably better than the, the prospects that we are at the time. Right. So the right, prospects still right now, could develop. Yes. Yeah. It's just you know, at the time, Granlin and Hoffman and Duclair and Zadina are probably better than our current crop of prospects in the Barracuda. Most of them. Obviously, Gushin, Bordalo, Robbins, like these guys have a lot of runway because they're younger. Yeah. And they can have um, great summers too. So I'm, I'm sure. not, I'm not, uh, I, I, you know, that's very, very possible. But based on what we saw last year and, you know, assuming a little bit of growth, right? Um, those guys aren't better than the Duclairs and Hoffmans of the world. They aren't. Uh, but if they have good summers, of course they can be. But, and I'd we'll rather see a season like Gushin's last year where he started off pretty poor like i watched most of the barracuda in the beginning and then all the way throughout the season he wasn't poor but he just wasn't getting it and then he got it a little bit more a little bit more until the end of the season where he's earning nhl time because you know it took time to develop and i think there's still dudes that need to develop that kind of thing it's and not yeah. like ozzy wise what's going to step into the to the fourth you know the third line role next year it's just not going to mm -hmm. happen yeah, I, I want to say, too, that, like, uh, I'm not saying that the approach of kind of letting stuff stick, you know, throwing shit on the wall and seeing what sticks, like, that can yeah. work. I'm sure yeah. there's examples in the past of that working, right? Um, but it's just sort of not my preference, you know, for team building, you know, like I like, again, guys earning it, but also too, I think that builds a, a good culture that like, you have to earn your job, you have to take take a job. Um, that's, that's just my my opinion. Uh, but I'm not saying that the other way doesn't work. It can, it can work too, maybe. Sure. Um, but yeah, again, just uh, my own preference. Yeah. And um, other thing to keep in mind is just next year or two years from now, all of the, like a lot of these contracts are gone. Like all of yeah, these guys be, yeah. are, should be probably gone. There's going to be a lot of jobs open. It might not be this season, but next two years, there's going to be a lot of jobs open and sharks are going to be finding a way to try and fill those with younger guys. Probably. Mm -hmm. Or at least hopefully so. It's the whole purpose of a rebuild, basically, is to to fill in those spots with younger guys. So speaking of, um, our next question is a little bit hard. It's from Patrick. Patrick says, What's your best guess as to 
the best possible and best probable lineups tops to bottom in three to four years, considering current contracts, prospects, available free agents on that timeline. I'd yeah. say <laughs> impossible to answer. <laughs> I have some, I have some thoughts about prospects that I can lay out. If you want to lay out some of the guys that you think will still be here in terms of the roster players. But, sure. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, Eklund, I, I do see as a more of a, and I think we agree on this, like a future second liner. I think yeah. Smith is right now earmarked to be a one C. So we'll see if, if he can be that guy. Um, you know, Beestead uh, looks like he projects to be second or third line. So hopefully he can be that guy. Uh, you have Thrun and Mukamadulin in, in the picture too. And I don't think that they become top pairing defensemen, but I think, uh, you know, top four is a, a kind of a, a valid hope. And you have some other guys here, you know, just kind of see like who, like who, who, who pops off, you know, who like takes the leaps yeah, as they are right now, guys like Quentin Musty, Halton in. Jake Furlong, you know, a, a, a lot of good prospects, Cam Lund, right? These guys aren't NHL guys right now, not even close, but uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see where they go. But um, those are the ones that I feel, I feel safest with uh, those, uh, those names mentioned. Um, yeah. yeah um, the other, the other, the other guys and the Sharks have a pretty good list of sort of, uh, you know, see prospects with some upside. Yeah. But they have a lot of guys like that. And so uh with uh, you know, a couple of breaks, you know, we, we can we can see uh, a couple of these guys become regular NHLers. Yeah, I think the the biggest um, thing to remember is, is two things: is that we as fans always overrate our prospect pools. Mm-hmm. Every single fan base does all the it. Time. It's, all it's, the time, it's I, inevitable. You know, <laughs> um, speaking yeah. of like sort of the. Uh, you know, I remember when I first started covering the Sharks and, you know, seeing future line projections and people had Chimileski, Blickfeld. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, Sasha Chimileski isn't going to be your third. Third line center is a really hard and important job in NHL. You're not giving that to Sasha Chimile- like to, to a rookie like his first year and assume that he can do that on a team that's supposed to be a contending team. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, my I, second I point is, is that projecting every single roster. Like if you say that Daniel Gushin has the – Upside of like a third line winger. I think that's reasonable. Even a second line you, winger. I, or a second I, I, I line. I think second line winger. I'm, I'm I think fine that's, with that. that's probably reasonable. But if you put that and you put in 12 Daniel Gustians and four centers that are all prospects and say, okay, that's our future lineup. 75% of those players are going to bust. Right, and right. It's just the way it is. <laughs> like, no, just, just looking at all of the Sharks forward mm-hmm. list, guys who like look like like promising right now, right? Like uh, Lund, mm-hmm. Smith, um, Musty, Haltonen. Uh, obviously, Gushin, Robbins, Bordalo, Eklund, right? Like, yeah, like if if like three of those guys really hit, you know, and that's like I think I just rattled off nine names. If three yeah. of those, if three of those guys hit, you're thrilled. Yeah, you're you're winning basically. Yeah. That's the whole the whole point of drafting is it's kind of a numbers game and it's like educated guessing and it's not like an exact science. If you mm-hmm. say somebody has the potential to be your third line center in the future, like Brandon Svoboda is a great answer. He was just picked. He has the mold of like maybe in the future could be your third line center. It doesn't mean that Brandon Svoboda is going to be our third line center in mm-hmm. 2027. It's just possible based on the way that he plays kind of thing. So right. you always got to just keep that in mind is that for prospects and projecting, it's, you know, it's a numbers game and you pick out players and you think it might fit, but uh, they might not even be the one, they might not fit on the sharks. They might be playing for like right. the Rangers next year. Oh, <laughs> we made the announced. same point too about uh, Nabokov mm-hmm. and Goldhagen prospects too. It's, it's a numbers game. Yeah, for sure. But it's hard to answer that question, Patrick. Um, I think Vlasic will still be here. No, I'm just joking. But <laughs> <laughs> Vlasic's here forever. He might be. He, <laughs> he might be, years. actually. Uh, his contract might still be <laughs> I on think the books. Three, three years left on his, his deal. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Vlasic will still be here. That's our answer. <laughs> All right. Next one is from Chris Dahlstrom. Where do you see players like Eklund? Thrun, Bordalo fitting in the Sharks this season? Or do all three of them start in the Barracuda? Is Gandalf Rock still in the Sharks' future plans? And does Mason Bopit find his way in the goalie mix somewhere down the road? Yeah, we obviously answered about Eklund and Thrun. Uh, both uh, Keegan and I think that they will start the season with the Sharks. I do not think that Bordalo will start the season with the Sharks unless uh, he has uh, uh, made a, a huge leap from last year. I still am bullish on Bordalo. I 
uh, love is skill. You know, I think there's 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 a lot in there, but um, it's sort of like uh, you know you know breaking a wild stallion. You know, there's a there's a lot of ability there, but uh, it's got to mm. be you know it's got to be a little bit uh, play a tamer game. You know, he's got to play a little bit of a tamer game, and if he does that, then I can see him making an angel impact. If he doesn't, uh, not consistently enough at least, then yeah, he may not be long for the the sharks. Um, anyway, uh, Larock and Bullpit. Uh, Larock is definitely still in the sharks' future future plans, but you have to see how healthy he is, right? But yeah, he was uh, definitely the you know last year. You mentioned Larock, you know, the summer of Larock. Uh, the summer yeah, of Larock. He, he was he was definitely a uh, rising. Uh, 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 like a bullet on Sharks prospect charts, but then derailed by injuries. So you never know. But he is supposed to be ready for uh, for development camp. That's what Todd Marchant uh, told us yep. on the first episode of the of the podcast. And so if he is ready for that, then I think he's very much in the mix. And we'll need we'll need, I'm sure, a lot of time with the Barracuda to get himself. You know, he only played five games last year, I think. And uh, Bullpit, well, Bullpit again. You know, like how will he perform? Uh, last year was a dismal year for him overall. Even when he got traded. To to, I think it was the ice, right? A pretty good team yep. there, right? And now the, the, the it's now the Wenatchee team. Um, I think you know he won games, but I, I don't I don't know if he he was uh, he was great necessarily. And so you know we'll see. Yeah, it, I mean Larock is still Larock, and I think the plan from Tom Marshall was was to perhaps to, to be on the Barracuda. I think mm-hmm. um, I don't want to say that like specifically because I think he can still go back to the WHL if necessary. Um, I believe, uh, but we, we need some confirmation on that, mm. but, um, I think he's going to play in the HL, but either way, it's still, he's still a prospect. He still was a good find at the fourth, um, round. He kind of came out of nowhere in that COVID year, um, to kind of surprise a lot of people. Cause he, he, he's a very steady defenseman and he's a right-handed shot and he's a good size and all that. So still like LaRock's future just needs a lot more time. I think this whole year for LaRock should be like rehab and getting healthy and getting up to speed because you know he's had like basically a year off from hockey and that at 19 years old hurts a lot of prospects so he mm-hmm. needs time uh Bo Pitt like you said is he's a go he's a project right he's like six foot five he's athletic he's big um but he you know did not have a consistent season in the WHL at all and even after getting traded to a really good team um he still didn't put up good numbers and he didn't look amazing he got beat out by um I think at a one year older prospect who's like shorter, but um, was the starting goaltender for Winnipeg. So I don't think that, you know, who knows in three to four, five years time, what Bopit is, but it's not like he's going to step in tomorrow and be on the AHL or anything. As a, as a short King myself, uh, I I'm hurt by any time uh, uh, someone says, Oh yeah, he, he, he's shorter than him. He's, he's not, he's not any good. Well, like the goalie <laughs> that was five foot 11 above <laughs> Bopitz, you know, is, is way better. So I don't know. It's not like, I think short goalies will have a comeback someday. Short like, King. We're already right? seeing it with, with Dustin Wolf, right? Like everybody loves Dustin Soros. Wolf. Yeah. Soros. Yeah. I think it's just, <laughs> You know, when you're looking at like, I can pay Aiden Hill two million dollars and you know get fine goaltending. Why not just get Aiden Hill? You know, anyway, that's my own little personal bias about goaltending too. I think we've talked about it before. But all right, let's move on to the next question. We have actually two from Finco who posted, I think, six questions, but we will answer <laughs> two of them. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Maybe they're already answered through other questions too. Yep. Um, but uh, first question is. Um, I had thought that the Sharks were now prioritizing prospects over picks, but the Carlson trade seems to suggest otherwise. Do you expect the Sharks to trade any more for any more picks at the deadline, or does Greer have enough draft capital to focus on getting prospects or players back? Um, and uh, the second question is, considering how little Greer seems to like most of the prospects drafted before his tenure, are there any guys in the system who are a candidate for a pure hockey trade like Reedy and Kanaizev, uh, who were traded for Pedersen and Gavanka? Um, do we see any previous untouchable prospects that are traded? Hmm. Oh yeah. So on the, on the first one. Um, so I think it's a mix. Yeah. I, I wouldn't uh, go so far as to say like the sharks are going either direction, like uh, a lot more than the other. I mean, look at the Timo Meyer trade, right? A good mix of, you know, there's a first round pick in there. There is a second round pick that they hope will turn into a first round pick, but they also have uh, guys that are closer to the NHL, like Muka Madulin and Ahotiak and Zetterlin, right? So it's a mix of that. Uh, looking at the pens, 
in the Penguins trade. The Penguins don't have any particularly attractive NHL ready prospects, I would say. I mean, they have Smith and Joseph, who you know could turn out to be something. Um, I, I don't. I think Pullen is not seen as a guy that's going to make it um, unless he really surprises. Even though he used to be, he was a first round pick. Uh, guys like uh, you know Jaeger and Pickering um, are younger right so so they are prospects but you know the the the, the penguins uh might be you know might not want to give them up you know teams generally mm-hmm. i think are more willing to give up a first round pick that they think oh it's going to be in the 20s or whatever than trade a guy like uh, that they just picked in jaegering this past year and pickering in 2022 um so i think it's a mix uh, i even though i have noticed and uh um and i've asked you know mike about this uh, kind of the older prospects that uh that that he's traded for um i don't think it's a one or the other thing so anyway if we're talking about the deadline specifically i i foresee a mix if they like the prospect they might even trade a draft pick for him which they did in, in henry thrun's case right um mm-hmm. um it just depends on on the team that they're trading with or if they don't really like the the team so much like what is there for the team um then then maybe they concentrate on on getting the best draft pick possible and so they can draft their own you know their own prospect uh the second question about um prospects that are sort of uh the last regime's prospects that that could be out the door right i think the one that stands out in terms of guy who is maybe untouchable quote unquote a couple of years ago uh is bordolo bordolo did have a tough adjustment last year in terms of obviously not scoring because he did a pretty good job at that at least in the AHL but uh he had a tough adjustment playing a kind of an all-around game two-way game that uh that the Sharks wanted and so if he continues to have that difficulty then for sure he's a guy that that can get that get moved uh, as soon as uh, this year uh he's, you know you want to trade him before he loses his value and you trade him for maybe another guy that uh you know higher pick that hasn't quite worked out for perfectly for another team either so he would be the one that really stands out in terms of um uh a guy from the last regime that was considered uh you know again quote unquote untouchable yeah i'll go i'll go backwards that way then so i think yeah i think bordelow is possibility i think if if you were trading bordelow in a hockey trade i think they would probably try to be getting like a offensive defenseman prospect so somebody yeah. that cause that's kind that's of what's definitely missing a in there. for that for sure yeah yeah, and, and I think Bordelow has enough trade ability to get somebody that and maybe not struggling on another team, but just like isn't fitting in with their prospect pool. <laughs> Bordelow for Ty Smith. Yeah, exactly. I was, <laughs> Who says I, no? I was about to mention uh, Bordelow for Ty Smith. <laughs> Something like that. You know, it's not impossible. But um, so and a couple other guys I think could be, if they don't have good seasons, um, could be on the trade block for something. Maybe somebody like Ozzy Weisblatt, former first uh, round pick. Um, from 2020 uh brandon co mm-hmm. mitchell russell was signed um i think he's going to be kind of one of these guys that is in a trade at some point just for contract reasons well but yeah he, Molly, he's, very, he's very touchable yes <laughs> that's a good way to <laughs> um and maybe robbins as well kind of similar to bordelow if there's a trade mm-hmm. available um but i think i think the the big three besides eckland is is gushin robbins and bordelow on the cuda and it's possibility one of them might be moved, but I won't, yeah. I don't, we don't have any information on that, but it would have to be like a good hockey trade. And then the second question, yeah, the, Greer focuses on like certain prospects. It feels like when he, he finds a player or prospect that he likes, like Muga Badulin, Henry Thrun, McAniemi, he'll make a trade for that prospect or older guy, like 20s, 22 um, age. Um, but other than that, I don't think it's like a, I think he wanted the the draft picks from the the team of Mayo trade just as much too. Like he got yeah. a first and maybe another first. So I think it's a mix, and I don't think he's going to single out like prospects. And the other thing is is these guys that are like eighteen, nineteen that just got drafted, um, that are really high picks like Jaeger and stuff. They almost never get traded. Like, yeah, they, I've not, yeah, really people said, oh, why didn't the Sharks demand Jaeger in the Carlson trade? Like they almost gotta, never do. Like when's the last time a guy? got drafted and a month later he, he was traded a first round pick <laughs> yeah like and he got traded just yeah it's very it's rare teams very, love very the guys that they just picked up and unless there's something that they need to get rid of 
for some reason, or they need to get for some reason, then they're very rarely. Yeah, they'd rather give you the pick next year because, well, they think that they're going to win the Stanley Cup next year. So Yeah, they're going to win the Stanley Cup, and also your scouting staff sucks and ours is better. Yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, so, um, (laughs) but yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I would say one thing, though, uh, with with Makanyemi, I don't know if he's quite in the Thrun, Mukumatulin class of sort of like uh, targeted prospect. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of sort of uh, places he could trade Brent Burns to. I remember him mentioning though that he liked the goaltending process. Oh, I mean, he—I like, yeah. I think he does like Makanyemi, but again, not quite yeah. like Thrun they specifically traded for, right? And Mukumadulin yeah. is the closest thing besides a first-round pick to uh, being the centerpiece of the Timo Meyer trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either way, but I think he, but I think he does value certain prospects. I think those prospects sure. are generally older as well, um, but then rather than the. Um, uh younger guys basically i think you'd rather have picks but all right next question is from eric pichette or sorry for pronouncing that wrong uh it's two questions in one basically but will joe thornton ever officially retire (laughs) just a good question uh still holding out hope that he can he does so his jersey can be up to next to patty's next season uh, and secondly, uh, is there any other uh, players besides Marlowe and Thornton that uh, have done enough to have their jersey retired? It's a good question. Okay, so uh, on the first one, uh, will uh, Thornton officially retire? Uh, eventually. This- eventually, yes, eventually he will. But uh, I don't think it'll be this season. That's just uh, 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 a guess. Uh so yeah, I don't think his jersey will go up next uh, next uh, or this coming season. Um Besides Marlowe and then obviously Thornton, um, Nabokov, Burns, Pavelski, Vlasic, and sneakily uh, Couture, uh, none of them have had the longevity or impact on Marlowe Thornton. So if it's Marlowe Thornton as sort of your bar, then I don't know if any of those guys quite make it over. But if you uh, if you loosen things up just a little bit, then I think those five uh, actually, um, well, we're missing a forward for 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 a starting lineup right there, but Owen Owen. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, so I, I think these five all have really good arguments, and I know that Vlasic is kind of sneaky in there, um, and he's was hasn't been the most popular shark, uh, not like Burns or or Pavelski in that class, and obviously uh, the last few years of Vlasic's tenure here too might leave a, a some sour taste with fans. But uh, Vlasic, I mean, man, you know, I mean, he's he's been here a long time. And yeah, the last few years, sort of because of the contract. But before that, though, uh, he was a great, great defenseman. And so I think there's an argument there. Even Couture, right? Even though, like, Couture became the captain uh, uh, of, of the team uh, and, you know, his ca- his time as a captain, you know, the team, not that it's his fault, but the, the team hasn't been in the playoffs, you know, hasn't been uh, particularly good. Uh, but Couture, you know, if he lasts even a couple more years in this contract, I mean, that's, you know, that's going to be like 15 years with the Sharks. So I, I think that there's going to be some argument for both those guys there. My, this is my own like philosophy, mm-hmm. right? But, I think it's just personally, I think it's just Marlowe and Thornton from that group. And I love, you know, Pavelski, Vlasic, Kutcher, Burns, Nabokov, Hurdle, guys that are like, I mean, Burns isn't a lifer, but guys that are always sharks forever. But if you put every single one in the rafters, we wouldn't be able to field the team. Um, so, or ice a team basically. Cause well, I, I think it's okay areas. because I mean, it, it's just fine. I mean, of course you'll keep adding more, uh, yeah. but okay. I, I will answer it this way though, because uh, who would be, Oh, who would you take from these five? Who, 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 who? If he, if he, if he had to take one uh, or somebody else, right? And I would go with Burns uh, just because of popularity, and also too uh, that you know when he was at his best, he was absolutely one of the NHL's best. I mean, he won a Norris Trophy. He was a Norris finalist too, a couple other times, I believe, right? Whereas the I other think- guys here, the Bokov, mm-hmm. Pavelski, Vlasic, Kator, were at their best. Really, really, really good players, uh, mm-hmm. great players, but maybe not anybody that would be like your top like one, two like defenseman in the league, forward in the league, goalie in the league. So anyway, so I might have one. I put. Well, first of all, I just the, the whole like jersey thing. It's like if I saw somebody else wearing Joe Thornton's number, I'd be like, "Why the hell are you wearing Joe Thornton's number in San Jose?" Mm-hmm. Like if I see somebody else wearing Couture's thirty nine, I'm I don't know. Like I'd be like, eh, "You can live with weird. it." <laughs> I think I could live with it, and I love Logan, and we just spoke with Logan, but it's not like I don't know. It feels 
different. I think in if well, I, any of these feel sacrilegious, then I guess is the yeah, yeah, right. That's what maybe we're my many maybe Pavelski just because okay. I loved seeing Pavelski and the way that he, um, just the way that he was as a as a player and as a uh, a leader for the Sharks, mm -hmm. and he was also just such a great story, like being such a great. You know, shark from a very, very. I think it was like a ninth round, over ninth round pick. Or yeah, something no, like that, seventh, or? seventh round pick. Yeah. Seventh. Okay, yeah. Um, but anyway, and then just playing for the Sharks for so long, I, I just maybe Pavelski, but hmm. I don't know. And Burns was traded for, so it's kind of different. I mean, Thornton was too. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing I'll say for Burns too is, of these five, Burns is the guy that's going to the Hall of Fame. Um, True. You know, Pavelski True. still has an outside shot of it, but um, yeah, yeah, but I don't think so. Yeah, probably, mm. probably not though. Um, and so, um, so yeah, uh, not that Nabby. I don't know if if Nabby no, will. He's not, he's not. I don't think no. so. But but you know, you, you, I know you don't decide who you uh, retire up there based on based on that. But but Man. I think just the overall with Burns, uh, he was very popular. Um, he was a true superstar. And um, yeah, and he's he has that cat. He's he's going to go to the Hall of Fame, I think. And so I, I think that all combines. That's like, also if I were to pick point. one, then, then that would be the guy. Though, like I said, they all have arguments. That's why I made yeah. a degree of argument for Vlasic Couture and Nabokov. I don't need to state his argument. I mean, definitely he yeah. you know he owns all the Golden <laughs> records uh, uh, on uh, on the Sharks. So, um, but yeah, yeah. And I, I really hope that Logan doesn't listen to this part of the podcast because then I feel like really bad because we just interviewed him. He's a great guy. And <laughs> just, <laughs> no, but you know, uh, pop he, in he uh, as well. Like he's been, you know, he was drafted by the Sharks, developed by the Sharks, captain of the Sharks. Like if he, if he guys. pops in like a hundred more goals the rest of his Sharks career, maybe something like that. And uh, he's part of the Sharks uh, a rebound. Like let's say he's the captain of the Sharks. Uh, let's go to to that question. The shark, the, the Stanley Cup winning Sharks 2027 team, right? Yeah, he exactly. lasts that long, like a uh, yeah. like Dave Andrew Chuck style. You exactly, know, like the yeah. old <laughs> veteran captain. Then, then, then actually he he might. So he, he might. still has he still has some runway to 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 do it. Uh, I wouldn't sure. wouldn't put it past him. You know, he still plays at a very high level. Um, but yeah, uh, not the most likely of those guys though. Um. And then also, yes, eventually Joe Thornton will retire. But I think the earth might stop spinning first. <laughs> um, next one, speaking of Couture. Um, this has got two questions uh, in one, basically. Um, well, two questions in, in general. But first question is basically, could we get multiple first-round picks for guys like Duclair and Hoffman in the 2024 draft? Uh, could we end up with like five first-round picks if we, if New Jersey's one comes from a, a second round to a first, and then we trade for two more of them from our, our UFAs to be is the first question. And then second one is, I saw a rumor on Top Shelf, Top Shelf Hockey YouTube that Couture isn't against going to a winning team. Is that possible or is it a bad rumor? Uh, what do you think for those two questions? Yeah. Uh, so number, uh, number one, um, yeah, no, uh, Declare Hoffman are not getting first round picks again. You have to, you know, uh, manage your expectations here. What did Declare, what was he worth this off season? He was worth Steven Lawrence and a fifth round pick. What was Mike Hoffman worth this off, uh, this off season? Literally nothing. He was a captain. He was actually worth less than nothing. He was a negative value player. Um, those you don't rebound from that even if you're if, even if you're really good uh, into to a first round first round pick. So mm -hmm. no, you're not getting a first round pick for him. Um, I think that you probably are looking more at you know mid round picks, anything from second round on down, maybe depending on how good they are. You know, obviously Declare Hoffman, they have scored thirty goals before, so if they're back on that somehow, um, then uh, then then sure, maybe 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 you can get a, a second um in terms of sort of the you know some of the other guys who might be available the biggest uh trade chip um i i think actually it, that it, it that if things work out of all the guys who are you know here on expiring deals lebank barabanov uh duclair hoffman that i think that if they hit their potential i actually think declare and hoffman would be worth the most just because um 
goal scoring is is so valuable. You know, Barabanov and LeBanc are a little bit more playmakers, so I think there's a little more value on goal scorers. And maybe Declare because Declare's a, a a little bit younger than 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 a Hoff. And also Declare uh, has had a you know good playoff success uh, in terms of with Florida, right, making it to the finals. So I think that could be a a bonus in in his favor. So uh, so if all 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 things uh, working out, then I, I see Declare having the the most value uh, to address the other rumor. Um, yeah, no, that's a bad rumor. Um, yeah, you know, like, 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 of course, like, like, Kator is aware of where the sharks are, and um, I don't think he's necessarily like. Like, yeah, he could be willing, right? But the Sharks aren't pushing, trying to push him out the door. And he wants to stay. And that's sort of mm-hmm. been what's been consistent. If a guy wants to stay, then Mike Rear isn't going to trade him for pennies on a dollar, two quarters on a dollar, uh, or, you know, retain or whatever, right? Um, and that's what would happen with Couture. If you don't retain, you're you're going to get, you're not going to get a lot back, just like in a Carlson trade. Or if you do retain, well, that's a value retention spot, right? And so it's, it that's, has appeared pretty consistent. Uh, he's not forcing anybody out the door. Burns and Carlson, they wanted to leave. And so until Couture gets to that point, and he is not at that point right now, and he tells us himself uh, in the interview coming up, um, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not likely to happen, at least not soon. Yeah. And I think you mentioned to us as well that it's he's very happy with his contract and very happy with being San Jose. Mm-hmm. And he, um, so at least not for the foreseeable future. Obviously, things can change depending on the, the nature of the Sharks rebuild. But for now, I think we're uh, Couture's uh, with us to stay for the time being. Yeah. And then I think we have another question in, in a bit about the um, – the value of some of our UFAs. Oh so yeah. We'll, I may have prematurely answered that one, but okay. Yeah. Anyway. We'll get to it in, in, in a bit and, and yeah. kind of go through them. Cause I think that's a good question. We have so many, so many UFAs to be. Yeah. Um, all right. This is a good question. Say it, this is from Zeke it says, say, say it's August, 2024. And people are looking back at the 2023, 2024 shark season, and they're calling it a success. What happened? Um, they yeah. get the number one pick Macklin yep. Celebrini. <laughs> Macklin Celebrini, baby. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this current shark team as is, though. Um, so I think what has to happen for them to to make a run for the playoffs, right? So uh, all or most of the veteran forwards have to kind of uh, be back to who they used to be or who they were last year. So that's everybody. Couture, Hurdle, uh, who struggled last year, uh, Mike Hoffman, Mikhail Granlin. The potential is, is there in so far as, look, like, Three years ago, right? Like five years ago, this forward group for the Sharks looks pretty good, actually. <laughs> Three years ago, baby, not not quite five. Three years ago, that was a pretty good looking forward group, right? Um, but yeah, so if Declare comes back, you know, all those guys, right? Barabanov is good again. Uh, LeBanc finds his game and is more consistent, right? Um, and so the Sharks forward group actually, like, you can maybe talk yourself into it a little bit and maybe they can form like the Kraken, like kind of mm-hmm. a, a deep four line attack. Uh, of you know, there's no superstars obviously in this forward group, but you just have four lines of of uh, of you know that are dangerous kind of. Um, the defense actually can be pretty good defensively. Uh, again, talking yourself into it a little bit, but you know maybe this, this defense can be pretty good defensively, even though they are uh, uh, playing guys you know up you know maybe more than they should. I mean, basically guys like Ferraro and Benning and possibly Rudda are going to get like top two, top four minutes, and maybe they're not those guys, right? Um, but you know, but maybe overall there will be a solid uh, 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 group defensively, and uh, they get by offensively. And finally, I think the most important thing, uh, goaltending can change everything. So if Mackenzie Blackwood could come back and he can live up to sort of his hype from a couple of years ago, you know, a lot of people thought that he was a future Team Canada starter just three years ago. And so if he comes, so all those things kind of come together, then th- eh, then maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the biggest thing I, I'd like to answer this question is that it's saying people are looking back and calling it a success. Right. And I think it really <laughs> depends on who the people are, right? So people that are in love with tanking for the Sharks, the tankers, will say if they get a top three pick or, you know, first overall pick, it's a success. Or right. somebody like Macklin Celebrini, we get a new prospect to, for the rebuild. Success. It doesn't matter what happens in the ice. Other fans want a competitive team, like you're mentioning. Like, a, um, we've got all these new players. We've got a deep-ish forward core. Um, you know, maybe we could field something that's not so 
miserable <laughs> on the ice for the past, like it has been for the four years. And that's totally fine of their definition of what success is. Um, and then some fans just want like the prospects to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. They want something from Eklund, Bordalo, Thrun. That's Abdul. a good, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. They want progression in that the rebuild is on the back end. It's starting to come forward. So, you know, it's kind of who you ask. I think that uh, it's a few things. I think it's, we do need a top five pick. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm in the, I'm in that tank crowd in that I think we need more picks. There's, there's you want to lose in the first round to Vegas? No, <laughs> not this year. Uh, maybe three years from now, but I, I think we do need a top five pick. I think guys like Eklund do need to take a step forward to become full-time NHLers. Mm -hmm. That includes Thrun, uh, maybe Bortolo, if somehow he can, he can crack through this lineup. And then I think a guy like Ferraro needs to really, there's just so much opportunity for somebody who can actually move the puck on the blue line that I think if somebody like Ferraro could somehow um, develop a little bit more offense to his game, I think it could take him far in this mm -hmm. group. And he's young enough that he could still be part of the future Sharks team sure. that need him, basically. So that would be my definition of success. All of those happening, or at least one of them, the top five pick happening. <laughs> um. Barracuda culture issues. This is, there's been a lot of rumblings about culture issues and other concerns. This is from jo Jod V um, in the Barracuda organization, starting even before Martin Kaut's statement came out. What insight do you guys have on these issues, real or perceived? What, if any, impact do you think this has on the Sharks? Is anything being done at the executive or ownership level? Chang, we did a whole well, episode on this. Yeah, the Anthony Declair <laughs> episode. And so, you know, uh, to add, I guess, overall to it, and I mentioned it on that episode that, you know, things have a way of leaking out, right? And so if things are really, really bad, like the rest of the league will know it, the rest of the AHL, rest of the NHL. That hasn't quite happened here yet. And so it is something to monitor to see if there's anything more to this, or it is maybe just uh, mainly the count and, you know, things are kind of ironed uh, uh, smooth over uh, this season overall with, with everybody's experience there. So uh, I would say that wait and see, but I don't know if there's anything extra than uh, what, uh, what we reported a, a few weeks ago there. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. I think the Barracuda are fine. And I think, um, obviously, things to watch out for, but I don't think there's enough evidence to say that there's like a huge culture issue or anything like that as of now. But I am sure that the, the article put a little bit of a magnifying glass on them. So we'll see what comes up through next season. This is from Basking Shark, which is a cool name. Um, <laughs> Something I've been meaning to ask for a little while. Is there a chance uh, that something just kind of clicks with the Sharks this season and we are sort of accidentally don't tank for another lottery pick? Um, I guess really my question is, has this happened historically in the NHL? Someone projected to be horrible. And could it happen to the Sharks that they make the playoffs and don't tank for a lottery pick? Sure. I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, and uh, you, I know you have a few examples, but I'm going to give you an example from Sharks history. The 2003-04 Sharks, we just talked with Alan McCauley, uh, who was on that team and won a, uh, I'm sorry, he was a Selkie finalist for that Sharks team, right? And the hockey news, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the hockey news uh, pre yearbook preview, right? That was like my my hockey Bible. I bought that every year for like a decade. And <laughs> anyway, uh, the hockey news uh, picked, them, uh, picked the Sharks to finish second to last in the Western Conference uh, before the 2003-04 season. Oh, boy. That Sharks team made it to the Western Conference Finals, the first Sharks team to make it that far. And so this kind of stuff happens uh, all the time. Uh, I would say that for this Sharks team, though, maybe a little more unlikely just because they have a lot of veterans uh, who are kind of on a decline as opposed to that Sharks team from 2003-04. Had a, like, younger guys or guys that are kind of unheralded, you know, guys that surprised you right and um you know uh veteran guys that are on the decline once they kind of go you know into it right they usually don't come back or rebound in like a super significant way so like guy like honestly like a mike hoffman right former 36 36 goal scorer uh, he probably is closer to the 15 goal guy's been the last two years just because well we have a, 120 plus any uh, games of angel tape you know so you know you're kind of rolling the dice on him hoping that you know he finds something and you can flip him right um yep. but anyway though uh so it's more likely that that's not going to work uh not, it's not gonna work out for that reason it's not a but it's not a team of young upstarts like the 2003-04 sharks team um but it, it's possible sure yeah and obviously a couple recent examples like 
Vegas in their first mm-hmm. year. They made more the veteran playoffs. teams there too. So yeah, veteran team, but was kind of universally panned as like gonna miss the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah. you know I was there and I, I thought so. So yeah, <laughs> Seattle this year after they like basically journalists or i guess hockey media did the opposite where they were like oh seattle's actually going to be good guys right in their first year and they were bad and then this year they were like well they were bad last year so they're going to be bad again and guess what they're good yeah (laughs) so and then also a couple more blues and their their stanley cup playoff run were like near last place in the nhl sure sure sure. and then they went on to win the cup but they weren't you know projected to be last place in the nhl when they started the season they just no they weren't um and like midway through and la won the cup as like an eighth seed and they weren't good for most of the year um but none of those teams were kind of expected to be anywhere close to being as bad as the sharks are expected to be yeah um, i think so i mean the, you can make an argument vegas seattle maybe vegas, vegas yeah for expansion yeah but i think though but there's I thought, so much I, I thought that yeah. the vegas team that year would be competitive i thought that they would yeah. be one of those like 10th seed teams or whatever that like are kind of in a hunt for, for, for a while, you know, if everything works out, they can make the playoffs. And so, um, so yeah. So I would say the sharks team is definitely projected to be worse. (laughs) Yeah. It's just also like, there was guys where on Vegas, it was like, okay, this guy could theoretically step into this role if he does. And he, and he did, or like they had a guy like flurry where it's like, if he plays like flurry, you know, it can happen, but the sharks don't have that kind of thing. Really. It seems like. Well, I, mean, I, would, I, I would disagree Hoffman with that a little bit. And yeah. Clare, get yeah off, like, looking back their, at their the Vegas starts. team, like, no one could predict predicted William Carlson going off for 43 goals, right? True. So if somebody like that goes off for the Sharks, <laughs> that, that changes the, yeah. the projection, definitely. And they had a couple guys, obviously, March of Show and Smith and Perron and Neil uh, that had offensive track record, right? But the True. Sharks have guys like, they have a lot of guys like that, right? Uh, Granlin, Couture, uh, Hoffman, uh, and et cetera. Guys with, you know, very good offensive track records. Um, you know, the, the Vegas team also had a Shea Theodore kind of come out of, and also Alex Tuck. So, you know, could, yeah. uh, could a William Eklund produce like an Alex Tuck or somebody else? Very possible. possible. Or we're missing that, that, uh, yeah. we're missing that offensive defenseman. I think. No, they, they are for sure. They yeah. sure. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of like loss, yeah. loss production as well. Like Meyer was a huge sure. amount of production. They're, they're replacing it with multiple guys, but, that's a huge loss. Carlson, you know, 100 points last year. That's a sure. huge loss. It's not going to be like nothing just because he was, you know, not as great defensively. It's still going to be really hard to move the puck uh, for the Sharks' blue line. They lost Lorenz, Spanino, mm-hmm. guys that are like good bottom sixers. Um, they're a slightly deeper forward group, like I think you're saying, like, but I don't think they have any stars really other than Couture and Hurdle, who are just good top six forwards, but that's yeah. it. Um, yeah everyone's kind of playing above their actual level of play on paper. And that's what that Vegas team was, was like, I didn't think that William Carlson could be more than a third line winger. And turns out he's a top line winger. So (laughs) it just, it seems like on paper, everybody's kind of playing above their actual station for the sharks, which is never a good sign to start the season. No, it's not. But you know, uh, one one thing about the the defense that I'll mention too, though, is that, um, you know, I, I, you know, I covered that team and you look back at the kind of like the the top six of that team, you know, Nate Schmidt, Shea Theodore, Derek England, uh, Braden mm-hmm. McNabb, Luca Spiza, now Sharks development coach, uh, Colin Miller, right? Um, and so looking back bad. on that, that's <laughs> that's not a very good group overall. Yeah. I mean, I think McNabb uh, was you know surprisingly better. So basically, you can have some surprises, right? Obviously, they had a, a Shea Theodore and uh, Nate Schmidt, who are slightly were definitely younger, and some people thought that they could be top four defensemen, maybe, and they ended up being top four defensemen. And yeah. so I don't know. The Sharks may not have that potential, but it's also not a uh, a intimidating defensive group at, at, at all. Yeah, I mean they're not. It's just kind of deep, but not great. Yeah, I, I guess is the way to put it. And that's kind of what the Sharks are right now too, just without any kind of offensive guy. I mean, like you can talk yourself into it, but I'm not. So <laughs> I'm. I think it's still going to be a bottom ten team. Um, pro- bottom five. Worse. Probably bottom five. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, our, our best offensive point production right now is from Matt Benning. I think. And yeah, it is last like, year, twenty-four points. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I, I had a stat. Um, uh, Carlson had one hundred and one points last year. Uh, the eight veteran Sharks defensemen right now on the roster: Vlasic, Ferraro. Uh, you can. Yeah, I don't need to mention all of them, but the eight veteran guys uh, with NHL deal, Shimmick, guys like that, right? Uh, those eight combined for seventy-seven points. So. <laughs> 
you know, so <laughs> I don't know. Well, we'll see. Points aren't we'll everything, see. but <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it also exactly. doesn't help that we don't have Mark Andre Fleury in the, 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 the defense. The defense, uh, uh, I think, the team defense should be uh, a little better. Um, and so maybe that 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 will help uh, go a long way. And if, sure. if Lockwood is good and he can do his best, uh, Mark Andre Fleury uh, 2017 yeah. 18 uh, uh, impression, then uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Either way, watch. And then if it starts to go south, just you know, cheer for the tank. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, Downriver. We got uh, four more left uh, before we're getting out of here because we're getting kind of long here, but. Uh, Downriver asks, it's pretty clear that the Sharks 23-24 season ceiling is being close to a wild card spot due to the defense, but more likely another bottom 10 finish. Hey, look at that. Um, how much trade deadline value do you think Couture and recent acquisitions have towards more picks in the 2024 draft? Okay. Well, I already answered a question about uh, uh, Le- uh, LeBanc, Duclair, Barabanov, and Hoffman. Uh, mm-hmm. Just to repeat it, second and mid round. Uh, remember that in general, that kind of offensive guys who aren't like special, special guys, you know, right. Like, like Jack Eichel types, right. Uh, you know, non-special offensive forwards who score for bad teams, you know, they're a little dime a dozen at, at the trade deadline. So I don't, I don't see a first at, at, at all. Um, you know, just example last year, Max Domi went from Chicago to Dallas, got a second. And so that is, I think, sort of the, the ceiling that you might be looking for for these forwards and more likely sure. a third or a fourth for these guys. And you're fortunate if you get that, too, I think. Um, Rudda and Granlin, uh, because they have uh, uh, two years left on their contract, I think they're probably more valuable next year when they're expiring. So hopefully they're able to maintain or raise their play from last season. And uh, Couture, of course, we talked about that. I don't think he's leaving, but I wrote about this. Um, actually, I think the, the trade deadline this past season, I was just curious what sort of his value is, right? And Couture has a lot of those intangibles. Um, and not and not just intangible in terms of leadership, but also he's perceived as a guy who raises his game in the playoffs. That is mm-hmm. very, very valuable. And so I can see Couture. The Sharks will have to retain quite a bit of his contract, I think, to make it work. But uh, I don't know if they want to because that means that you know Couture's got four years left, so you're basically – taking up your your retain, retention spots for the next two years, right? Between Burns, Carlson, and Couture, and between Carlson and Couture for four more years, right? Um, and remember, we only, you only get three retention spots. But uh, if if Couture wanted to leave, uh, if the Sharks uh, you know, retained a good amount, I could see Couture getting uh, like a late first-round pick. Um, you know, again, he I think he's still seen as a, a, a model second-line center uh, and a model playoff second-line center. And so those those two factors, I think, do uh, contribute to uh, to his overall value. You know, it have to be some team that really needs a center um, that yeah. is willing to pay for it, basically. But yeah, his contract still with his age, uh, you'd have to retain. And I don't. You have to retain what, a lot, yeah. And that's yeah. yeah, that's that's a question mark with the Sharks. Yeah, so whether or not they want to tie those up for three years, but yeah, um, the other ones I agree. I think your your LeBanks, Duclairs, Barabanovs, Hoffman, somewhere in like the second to the mid rounds, depending. I think Hoffman and LeBank have the downside of being a little bit more expensive, so mm-hmm. you're paying four point seven. There's a cash, yeah, yeah. Well, cash and also oh, and also AAV. AAV, You're right, yeah. Because when it, when the teams are are get up to the cap at the trade deadline, trying to like squeeze in every dollar, it's like sure, well, I gotta sure. pay. Hoffman, you know, even just a little bit more dollars. I don't know if I can do it kind of thing. Whereas Bear Benoff and, and Duclair are, are a little cheaper mm-hmm. if you're looking for that offensive winger um, and a little younger too. I mean, LeBanc's young, sure. but um, youngish. Sure. Uh, I've insulted old people and, or no, yeah, young people <laughs> and short people and everything this podcast. But, um, Poor kings, short kings, and all kings in between. <laughs> I don't think that another first is going to come from those guys unless no. there's some sort of deal where you're packaging like every hole that a, an NHL uh, or a Stanley Cup team needs. Like you're sending their backup goaltender, their second, you know, second pairing D-man and their, their winger, they'll be like, maybe there's a first in there, but it's hard to do. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Ruta and uh, Granlund, I think, are, are probably traded next offseason, mm-hmm. unless some team, or they're just going crazy and some team really wants them. Um, I still think that Jan Ruta has value, but um, yeah, it, it wouldn't be crazy high value. I don't think you're getting a first for, for them. Mm-hmm. Um, Simic. 
McDonald's, LeBanc, um, or, or Lindblom, I should say, the other UFAs. Um, I don't know, kind of like either very late picks or or waiver fodder. Nothing, yeah. Yeah. So I think we're going to get more picks, but I just don't know if it's going to be another first. That's what my answer is. Yeah. All right. Uh, last three. Matthias893 says... Um, it's kind of a longer question. Yeah, Basically, we can just are the Sharks going to trade <laughs> trade someone before the season starts? Yeah, okay. Um, is this um, where we and before, yeah, before, yeah, so before camp, and um, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm sure they're trying to trade like a LeBanc and a Shimmick, right? And maybe even McDonald, but right now there's not a heavy market for those guys, right? Because they didn't have great seasons last year, or were hurt, or whatever, right? And so I'm sure they're trying. Um, I did want to talk about we talked, you know, uh, uh, or we mentioned that that we would talk about the Le, the rumored LeBanc Myers trade. Uh, yep. and, and if that could still happen, I mean, we'll see. September 1st, uh, uh, Tyler Myers does have a bonus, a $5 million cash bonus that's paid out to him. And so um, he definitely becomes more valuable after September 1st because even though you saw to take on his cap hit, which is $6 million, you don't uh, have to pay him that much cash. You know, that's only $1 million cash. He's also on an expiring deal. Uh, $6 million uh, AAV for him and uh, $4.725 million for uh, LeBanc. So we'll see. Um, you know, makes some sense. The Sharks obviously have a lot of veteranish defensemen. Um, but, uh, the two things in Meyer's favor, uh, first, uh, he does have some experience on a power play, even though it was a while ago. So, so I don't know how great he'll be on there, but he does have some experience on that in his prime. He was a good power play player or sure. a useful one at least. And I think the second thing too, is, um, that if both players manage to find their games, I'm talking about LeBanc and Myers here, right? Um, you know, LeBanc goes back to being like a 40, 50 point guy. Uh, Myers is able to step up and, you know, actually Myers still played a lot last year. He still averaged more than 20 minutes, but you know, Myers is able to find out offensive component once again and why, and still be good defensively. Um, it's a good gamble for the sharks because uh, a defenseman who's going a, a legit top four defenseman uh, is definitely worth a lot more than a kind of a uh, more offensive, you know, one dimensional winger that, yeah, he's putting up points, but what else is he doing for you? Right. Whereas a guy like Myers, if his, game is working he's doing a lot of different things for you can play in uh, all all uh, special team situations and so um so yeah so possible we'll see we'll see once september 1st crosses if anything comes uh, of that uh i would say that it can make sense for the sharks to to do that uh if not myers another bad contract um, and somebody that can play some power play. So we'll see. Uh, I have another question too about Barabanov. Um, you know, ha, you know, uh, the, the question phrased that uh, Barabanov has already proven he could drive offense in a top six role. He has not. You know, he's done that for a bad team. And I don't think around the league people necessarily believe that he can do that on a playoff team. You know, this is be like a very, contest. very good third liner on a on maybe, a um maybe. on a playoff team i think maybe if his style fits whatever that team's trying to sure. do but uh, here's an example right like like couture versus barabanov right they're not a perfect comparison but their offensive production may end up being roughly the same uh next year or it has been the last couple of years right close but couture is so much more a valuable player uh, seen as such in the playoffs yeah. so much more so you know, if Katora was making two point five million dollars, the Sharks could talk about maybe getting two first round picks for him. <laughs> you know, that's that that's that's how valuable a guy like Katora, you know, playoff tested, um, a center, uh, plays a a you know he 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 plays uh, in the gritty areas. You know, will get inside, isn't afraid of any of the tough areas in the playoff in playoff hockey. Will block shots for you, can kill penalties, all that kind of stuff, right? Basically, a uh, do everything Swiss Army guy, right? Those guys are super valuable in the playoffs. All these other guys, you know, Barabanov, uh, even Hoffman, Duclair, LeBanc, guys like that are not Swiss Army kind of guys. They basically do a couple things really well, and they don't do it if they're not putting up goals. They aren't really helping you win. And so um, anyway, so I, 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 I would push back on that. Like, yeah, Barabanov has been a revelation for the Sharks. He's on a great contract. Um, but keep in mind though, that he's been putting up these numbers on a really bad team. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's my overall take on all that. 
I think there was a rumor. This is obviously a rumor, so in big bold letters, rumor. But that that maybe Boston was interested in Barabanov at the trade. Oh really? Deadline. Oh, I actually I had, had I never heard of that one. I remember reading that last trade deadline, but it was or was it the year before when I think he was on his one million dollar deal? Um, still. Yeah. Again, though, he again. I, I, I've talked with a lot of people about Barabanov. I mean. Mm-hmm. I, I do like him more than the scouts I talk to. I think he's a little better than they say, but they True. don't see a guy that like you plop on a playoff team and he's driving offense on your second line. They don't see that. Like that I is valuable. Would do really well if you if he was that guy. Ball, I don't even know if he'd do on the third line because it's just his style of game. Maybe he would. Maybe not. I I, I just I, I I don't know. I I, I guess mm-hmm. that's the point. I don't know. I don't know if he's a guy that has benefited from. Uh, all the playing time he gets, you know, whereas opposed to like obviously talk about Couture, but even Hurdle, right? Like Hurdle's well, yeah, abilities those dudes are, are also centers are, and, and like more, well, yeah, you know, well rounded. But my too. point is though that those their abilities are clear. Like, yeah, like for sure. you can watch them and and see that they're on this bad Sharks team. But if they were on a good team, you don't, you don't, you don't, yeah. you don't question any of the transition, you know. Whereas with uh, Barabanov, I do. Yeah. I th- I think he could if he you know produces as well as he he does he could get that kind of Max Domi ish return but maybe I think more third line I I don't know that's 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 my we'll see I mean yeah. I think he'll he might be traded but um yeah. it's uh, he also just still needs to keep putting up points which it's like yeah he's done it for two or three years now um but it's like he got him for essentially nothing no I mean, yeah no I'm not questioning that. that's yeah. one of the great when we talked about Doug Doug uh, yeah. uh Wilson a lot on on on, the, on his podcast today uh good and one bad and that's one of uh, mm-hmm. Doug's uh, uh great trades and probably Doug's like last great trade and Doug did make a lot of great trades so let's not forget sure. that but uh that's uh probably his last great one though uh, yeah a bear bon off for Suamella yeah so we'll we'll see I, it, but I don't think he's again not going to get a first I also don't think he's traded before training camp I think they they yeah, want to sure. keep him until the deadline so sure, sure. um all right last co- or last two questions this is kind of like a multi-part question but uh, and I think the end of the day we'll, we'll get to the final question but what happens when Gushin outplays Zadina in the preseason? We don't read all of them they all they all kind of when Ozzy is more impactful yeah. than Zetterland yeah. basically what happens when if when some young guy outplays the, youngsters the old outplay guy. Yeah, which we kind of answered already, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't – I think this is a combination of things. I think is the first thing is that we tend to overrate our young players um, for sure. I don't think that Ozzy Weisblatt is ready to play in the NHL. I don't think that Muka Badulin could outplay most of the, the Sharks. Defenders. I mean, last year there were questions of Ozzy, honestly, could play in the AHL. And so you're already yeah. expecting him to be more impactful than, uh, you know, I know Zetterlund was terrible for the Sharks last year, but, um, but he's an NHL player. He's an NHL player. And also too, he's yeah. a guy that won the Sharks trade for him. Uh, you know, a lot of people liked him. Um, and if he, if Zetterlund can find his game, uh, and Zetterlund did show that game with New Jersey last year, Ozzy has no good NHL tape. Zetterlund does have good NHL tape. Yeah. And and Muka Madulin out playing like McDonald and, and Shimmick, maybe, but also would you rather he play like nine minutes for the Sharks a night or play like 23 minutes for the Barracuda with top power play and penalty kill and develop more? And personally, I'd pick the Barracuda route for, for Muka Madulin at this point. Yeah, um, and and you can't just give a guy like, oh, people say, well, why don't you just, just put him on the top power play, you know, for the Sharks? You can't, you know, that's tough on a guy's confidence. You know, like I said, we yeah. talked about the whole like, kind of like uh you know nurture versus nature i don't know if that's a great 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 uh great great uh, comparison but yeah like mm-hmm. letting a guy kind of marinate in the minors a little more or just throwing him to the wolves right and i do think it depends on the guy some guys might excel with the throwing to the wolves thing right but i think a lot of guys though like you know i would say it's definitely better to be safer with it like be more cautious about throwing guys to the wolves and if you know if if you bring up a or if you uh, develop a guy and you think that he is really ready to step up and to you know face angel pressure and face the failure he's going to he's going to face as a rookie uh 15 20 minutes a night or whatever if you really think he's made he has that kind of metal or stuff in him then fine you know you, you know there are there are exceptions to the rule right but in general mm-hmm. though you don't want to give a you know, a, a guy that, you know, not even playing 20, like Mukamadulin's AHL average, I believe last year was about, I think I asked for this from sport logic was the, like, yeah. I think 16 minutes a night, yeah. you know? And so, so yeah. So like, what's he going to play time. in the NHL next year? You know, like, like nine yeah. minutes in a press yeah. box. So. Maybe. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's not good for his development. Yeah. 
hundred percent. And same the last thing with, with Gushin is that he's not physically developed enough to, to play in the NHL. Like he, he's a good prospect and he needs more runway and he showed that he's got flashes of mm-hmm. a lot. And of I, I, I think, you know, I, I think that the organization time. likes his compete, which I think mm-hmm. is, is going to help him in the long run over the guise of you know, maybe the similar ish build and production, right. Uh, prospects. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I think it's a stretch though. And Zadina's, last few years Zadina hasn't been a really good player like let's not kid ourselves sure. about that but like um i don't really necessarily gushin you know stepping up uh, and outplaying him in the preseason so these are all you know honestly reaches a, a bit uh the other part of the question uh, that was asked was you know will the media start questioning greer or greer or quinn in this case if this happens uh and we'll we'll, we'll see if it happens first but um um i felt and maybe uh, uh anthony you don't agree or other people uh that I asked a lot of questions in a preseason about, you know, I thought actually I, 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 I'll, I'll say it. And I, I ended up being not right about it in terms of the long-term projection for the year, but I thought Bordalo was better than some of the veterans in preseason. And I thought he was better than Eklund for sure. And I asked a lot of questions about Bordalo, right? And so if the questions are there, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask. You know, if it's one of those all things equal situation that we talked about earlier, uh, prospects, veterans kind of being around the same place, then what's the point of asking? Then we kind of know, you know, contract contracts do 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 play a factor in this, right? With Eklund, obviously, last year and the slide. You know, so that could play a factor. If that's the case, then that's the case. You know, I'm not sure if there's worth asking something that they can't really answer uh, 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 in full transparency. You know, they can't be totally honest about stuff like that, I think. Um, and finally, um, I think there's a general misperception of like how often like you know, I, I have Mike Rear's phone number. I can text him all the time. That's not how things like this work, though. You know, like, I can't mm-hmm. badger him about every single, hey, did you hear that, that rumor about Bear Bon off to Boston? Uh, give, give me the scoop, Mike, you know. Um, that's not, uh, you know, that's not that's not uh, the usual relationship between the the reporter and and the GM. So we not we don't get Mike all the time. So we get Mike, you know, after big things happen or before important events like the beginning of training camp, the before the draft, all that stuff, right? And we get a few questions, and we need to be selective about the questions. And so, um, yeah, but uh, Quinn, yes, you know, we 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 do get David all the time, and we'll 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 ask David these we'll ask David these or. We'll ask David these questions if they come up. Yeah, I just don't. Um, I worry that because of all the vets, that people are going to think that the Sharks are purposely stifling development. I don't think no, they're not. Per- they're, they're, it's counterproductive to to yeah. to again. The Sharks want to win, but they also want to build a long term winning team. Sure, um, they didn't add a bunch of guys that are really blocking again you know if william eklund can take mike hoffman's job you know if it, again the mike hoffman from the last two years then eklund doesn't deserve to be in the nhl right now <laughs> yeah. i mean yeah. yeah i mean i it's to me it's that that simple you know and if mike hoffman it goes back to being 25 30 go mike hoffman or we can say this about anybody mikhail grandlin right if he goes back to being 60 point mikhail grandlin sure. that becomes a good problem to have for the sharks okay yeah sure he's blocking an eklund to some degree but then, you know, if Granlin's scoring 60 points, he becomes flippable. If Hoffman is scoring 30 goals, maybe he becomes flippable again, too. Um, so, yeah. So so it's not a, kind of an either-or thing. So Yeah. And there is some something to be said that, you know, Zadina hasn't had a great couple seasons, but there might be still something there. So yeah, I think we'll they're going to want to try him out to, yeah. for a little while. So right. I wouldn't just write him off either i think they're gonna want to see if he's got anything yeah like, yeah know, give him a couple this. months like what does that do yeah. to goosh let's say gushin is better than zadina in the preseason right but they start sure. with zadina because they don't want to wave zadina and they want to give him you know 20 games or so in the nhl to see what he's really got kind of right sure. um how does that hurt gushin's development you know and shouldn't as long as he's down there ripping yeah. shots and playing on right <laughs> being uh, so the best I, I don't player, so. really see the big deal uh you know i you know either way with with this kind of stuff you know i just oh. yeah I, I, don't, I, I don't i don't see it yeah it's a i think a, a lot of it is just a scenario that is is not realistic and and uh and if it does happen and it's very clear then i'm sure shang will ask all the questions about it yep uh, right to their face <laughs> All right, Larry, this is our last question. Um, it's from Just Steve. Given oh, and then the- uh, before, let me interrupt. Uh, there are some questions that we didn't get to, and uh, oh, we yes. will talk about that too uh, right after Just Steve here. So go ahead. 
Yep. So Just Steve says, given how the past the past several drafts have resulted in very forward heavy drafts for the Sharks, considering how defensive prospects, not to mention goalies, seem to take longer to develop, do you see foresee any complications with the future of this rebuild? Feel a lot better about the future of the franchise. We had like a, a power, year check, Nemec, uh, prospect like defensive or defensive prospect in the system. Um yeah, so um, my, my thought on it is that um, uh, that uh, actually I didn't really quite think about it until now. So actually, thanks, Steve, for uh, for bringing it kind of to my mind. And maybe I'll write about at some point is that the Sharks have kind of remedied this problem, though, right, by acquiring uh, guys, a defense defensemen that are further along in their development sure. uh, curve. And obviously guys like Mukuma Doolin and Thrun, uh, uh, Hotiak, all these guys could be conceivably hitting their primes right with an Eklin and a Bordolo. And so, yeah, so I don't think it's a problem here. Yeah, it could have been a problem, I guess, uh, uh, if the Sharks didn't add guys. Yeah, it actually would be a problem if the Sharks didn't add uh, Mukuma Doolin and Thrun and guys like that because who would the Sharks' top defensive prospects be? They'd be... Ryan Merkley or, you know, uh, Kanyazev, you know, and Havlid, who's far away, right? He's not close, yeah. right? Uh, Furlong, who's not close. And yeah, so, and, yeah. yeah, who's not close uh, also. Yeah. So, so there would be too much of a gap there between like kind of prospects in the Merkley or Kanyazev that you see like, eh, they're not going to be great, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, guys who are too far away, you know, all the Hablet and company guys. Right. And so Greer has kind of filled that place. And I, I'm pretty sure it's on purpose where, you know, he, he's fitting in guys that he likes, obviously the scouting staff likes, but also guys that um, have a, are a couple of years ahead of the Havlids and whatever in development. I think it's also just um, my opinion, but, the, the shark, well, not just my opinion, but the sharks just didn't have the opportunity to draft those kind of guys. Your check, Nemec, power, sure. like they're not guys that were in the sharks' range, right? So, um, I'm always of the favor, especially in a rebuild like this, you just take the best player and see who's going to pan out. Like, you can add in other prospects, other players for, for positions that don't mm -hmm. that you need to. Yeah, fill. I agree with you. Yeah, right? I agree you just got to get good players. Like, that's this is it. We need top of the lineup guys. And um, he did already, or Greer's made a point of like overhauling the depth of the defensive pool. It's not like we've got the, the number one guy up there, but we have overhauled the depth a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're right, match the kind of timelines for those players. And also um, the guys that maybe you could consider that they, the Sharks didn't get, somebody like Lane Hudson, who still has lots of issues with his game, was a second round pick, smaller guy um, over somebody like Havlid or Lund. But even then, he still has a chance to bust. Maybe you could say something like Brand Clark over William Eklund. Right. That's a they had the choice of drafting one of they those. They had two. the that's those are the ones that you have a choice of, right? Yeah. And even then, it's like I don't know. It's still a huge that would be a huge debate. Are Eklund or Clark? Clark still mm. hasn't made the NHL yet. He looks great in juniors. Eklund looks great in, in many different levels. So still a debate. Or maybe you could. If you really want to go crazy, you could debate Reinbacker over Smith or Stimashev. <laughs> and I saw some of my comments when I yeah. suggested that that was remotely possible for the Sharks. So. And everybody would have, you know, <laughs> lost their minds. So it's like, I just, the, the Sharks just haven't had the opportunity in the past, like, three drafts to really be in a position to grab one of these guys. Um, maybe this is the year. This is 2024 class is supposed to be pretty um, defenseman heavy, um, except for Macklin Celebrini, the the future number one center for the Sharks. Um, <laughs> but I, they just haven't had the chance, and I think they will address it at some point. Um, and they've been taking good options at defense along the way, just not guys that are like your number one power play quarterback going to play 25 minutes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So in the future, they will. It's a little concerning, but I, I think there's still time to go on this rebuild. You, you can build a over. winning team with, with six defensemen who are like top four, six top four defensemen, basically. Oh, sorry just about that. good players. Yeah, just need good players, and yeah, it's not over yet, right? This rebuild isn't over by like a long shot. There's still yeah, no, I, I just got a call. We're 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 over now. <laughs> no, you did what? <laughs> this is it. All right, so that's our last question. Chang, do yes. you want to talk about the ones we didn't get? To? Yes. So, um, 
on uh on 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 the website it's a it's a little like uh, uh inefficient to figure out who is a subscriber or not i had to input every name and sometimes it seems like uh people may change their usernames from what they signed up uh, uh for or what they you know i don't know paid with or whatever right and so uh i couldn't get to or we didn't get the questions from uh sharks fan uh robert evans berserker smoky middletons Dustin, name. CB, Nelson, and the Chichu train. And a question or two here might have just been, they weren't serious questions. But if you are a subscriber and I did not get to your question, I am sorry about that. We're sorry about that. It wasn't on purpose. I just couldn't find uh, like the matching username. I put in your username. I couldn't find that. And so uh, if you do want your question answered, I'm glad to do it either personally or uh, we can do it next week on the podcast. Um, so anyway, uh, just uh, uh, you can email uh, email me. Um, just my name at a Gmail. And it's, I think I also put my email on my Twitter. So it's not like I, I hide it from the world. So you can just email me there. Um, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so you can just do it that way. Or you can comment on the, you know, uh, in the uh, in the comments for this article or, or whatever. There's different ways. But just 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 let us know uh, somehow. And uh, and uh, and and we will get to uh, your your questions either you know individually or like I said next week. Uh, but anyway, otherwise, uh, guys, uh, we have a great interview with uh, Logan Couture coming up. A lot of uh, great stuff. A lot of Eric Carlson talk. And so yeah, uh, take a listen. Yep, enjoy, guys. And Logan, if you're listening, I 100% said your your jersey should be in the rafters. And um, <laughs> congratulations uh, on being a new dad, Logan. Yes, and, and on your jersey game, retired uh, uh, 10 years yep. from now. So. <laughs> All right, have a good one, guys. Joining us on the podcast this week is longtime Shark and current captain, Logan Couture. Couture has been captain of the Sharks since 2019 and has spent his entire career in San Jose since being drafted in the first round, ninth overall in 2007. He's the definition of a clutch playoff performer, including a notable year with 30 points in 24 games during the Sharks' Stanley Cup final run against Pittsburgh in 2016. He joins us this week to talk all about the Eric Carlson trade, how the Sharks move forward in the coming years. He and his fiance Brielle, also welcomed into his life his first child this past week, Caden. Welcome, Logan. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me. Logan, uh, first, uh, congratulations on Caden. Uh, what's the first week of being a new dad like? And thank you so much for coming on. You know, you're, you've been a dad for a week. So yeah. On with uh, us. yeah, it's it's been incredible. Um, it's been some work, but we were prepared for it. Not a lot of sleep, but uh, we were also prepared for it. Um, but it's just awesome to be able to spend time with him right now. It's uh, it's almost a blessing that it happened during the off season. Um, so I'm able to help Brielle out quite a bit with uh, with waking up in the middle of the mm. night. The uh, the little guy's got his days and nights mixed up, so he's been uh, he's been awake almost every hour for for the first ten or eleven days in the middle of the night. So we're uh, we're doing well though. It's 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 been awesome. I'd ask you, have you received any good advice on being a dad yet from your Sharks teammates, uh, older teammates like Jumbo or even younger ones like Tommy? I think just the overwhelming message that I've got is enjoy every minute. It goes by quickly. Um, and, and I feel like it's true, even though he's only been alive for, for 12 days or so, just to see how much he grows in the first, you know, day by day. So, um, you know, I was with uh, Joel Ward actually the other day and he, oh. he said, he said, just enjoy every single second with him. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Congratulations again. And um, we're going to get into like the, the meat of the interview now, but how do you guys move forward after this week where Eric Carlson was traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins? Um, how do you guys move forward after that? Um, you know, it was almost inevitable. I, I, I think for, you know, a couple months, everyone that fig everyone figured it was going to happen. I know that, uh, that Eric badly wanted, wanted it to happen and the Sharks were going to try their best to get it done. So it was expected, but at the same time, you know, when it does happen, it's still kind of a shock to, uh, to the system. But uh, I think Mike did a, a very good job doing what he did. Um, you know, get, he gave Eric a chance to, to go play for a contender. So he did right by, by him. Um, and then I think he, he got some players that can step in and, and help us next year while adding a, a draft pick, which I know the, this organization has an idea of what they want to do. But, uh, you know, for me as a player, I see that he adds three NHL players that are going to help us this upcoming season, which excites me. And, um, you know, you can't replace Eric Carlson. He's a, 
he's a one of a kind player. He does special things on the ice that not many, you know, maybe say Kale McCarr maybe is the other one that can do some of the stuff that he does on the ice. He's, he's almost irreplaceable. So other guys are going to have to step up. Um, you know, it's as cliche as it can, can be, but uh, there's going to be more ice time to go around. There's going to be power play time. There's going to be penalty kill time to go for guys in the back end. And, um, you know, I'm sure those guys are, are looking forward to the opportunity to get a chance to, to play more minutes and, uh, I, I know personally I'm excited to get camp going once you, you hit about mid-August it uh, it starts to feel real again so we're getting close to that point point. and Carlson had said it was fun to play last year even with all the losing and everything that and that fun had been kind of missing from the locker room for the past few years and obviously there were some very public reasons for that about the COVID restrictions for the Sharks um, it's some of the Evander Kane drama um, maybe some more like defensive style of play under previous systems. Um, but do you agree with Eric that the fun had been missing last few years and did it come back last year? And why, if so? I think I, you know, I think I had a lot of fun the last couple of years, uh, even though losing sucks. Um, you know, it's a lot more fun when you win hockey games, but I think we had a really good group the last, last couple of years, even though we, we didn't win very many hockey games. I think, uh, I think Eric played really, really good hockey last year individually. And that probably leads to, to that, those comments for, for him. But um, yeah, we had a great group of, of guys. Uh, you know, I, I think really you can't really fault our effort last year on, on too many nights. Um, we were in a lot of hockey games. We played a lot of good teams close. We just didn't win games. And um, for us as a group moving forward, um, you know, that's kind of why where the focus is now. We've got to move forward. But at the same time, take some of the lessons that we learned last year in, in some of those tight games where we gave up late goals or our power play didn't get us an extra goal that we can, uh, we can move forward, um, you know, learning those lessons uh, and, and try and have a good training camp. I think that's one thing that we're going to have to focus on going into camp is to have a better start. Although, you know, last year we were over in Europe with that start when, when the travel was tough, but uh, I think the main focus this year is getting off to a better start. Uh, Logan, uh, yesterday a Pittsburgh reporter asked Eric about it, and I quote, strained relationship with Brent Burns. And Eric denied it and said they're good friends, uh, though he admitted that the losing was, you know, worrying on everybody in some sort of way. And I want to deny it, too. The reporter claimed that it was a report out of San Jose, and I've never seen such a report. I've never written such a report. So <laughs> anyway, uh, can you say anything about uh, their relationship? Yeah, I think they're fine. I mean, I, I didn't see any of that. So that's that's kind of news to me. I think, um, you know, they, they both play the same position. And I'm sure at times one guy would have liked to play, you know, a little bit more. But uh, I, I think they're fine. I mean, we went. I went over to Bernsey's house for dinner when we went to Carolina. And, and Eric was there as well at, at Bernsey's place. So I don't think strained relationship is anywhere near the, the truth. Hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't think so either. Uh, but I don't know. At that uh, barbecue, did Burns maybe serve uh, Eric more of the burnt ends of the of the barbecue or what? <laughs> no, he made about <laughs> four tomahawks that were unbelievable. <laughs> oh uh, what? Oh, go ahead. Guy. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to to ask you actually just uh just 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 a, a little fun here. Just what was uh what was your favorite Carlson story? And let me tell you my my favorite one first actually. And I'm not supposed to tell this story, but I think it's hilarious. And now all the parties are gone from the team, so why not? So I'm gonna let it let it let it fly here. So this was Vegas during the 2021 COVID year, and uh, I I was there at one of your practices, right? Uh, I don't know. If, I assume that you you were you were there too. Anyway, so back then, this is, you know, that year, the COVID year, I had to watch practice from the press box. Uh, no access to, to you guys, right? Not one-on-one, not -on -one at least. I don't know if you guys knew I was there or not. I mean, I had been kind of uh, at a number of road games already that year and, and road practices. But anyway, you guys are running a power play drill. Devin Dubnik. So uh, he, the, the puck goes uh, uh, behind the net. Devin Dubnik goes to get it. And Eric Carlson, in his loudest, shriekiest voice, says, Get the fuck out of the way, goaltender. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like him. I, 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 I'm glad I was in the press box because I, I died laughing. I, you know, I, it was totally a, a fun moment. And um, it, anyway, so that's that's my favorite Eric Carlson story. So what is your favorite Eric Carlson story? Oh, man, I think uh, just he he uh, he used so many sticks. This is just from last year off the top mm -hmm. of my head where, uh, you know, I, I asked him for an autograph an autograph stick for someone and uh there was about 
I think 30 games left in the year. And uh, I looked when I grabbed because he's like just grabbing off my rack. So I looked when I grabbed it and had the number like 125 in his tape. So I was like 125. Like I, some guys put the date on. So I was thinking yeah. maybe it was from January 25th because we were close to that date. And I asked him, I was like, Eric, what is that? The number at the top. He goes, oh, that's how many sticks I've used this year. Oh. And I was blown <laughs> away because I, I go through a stick. You know, I, I use a stick until it breaks normally. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the thought that he used 125 sticks in about 60 or 50 games so far in that year. Kind of blew me <laughs> away. Even at this level, I mean, guys go through sticks like crazy, but uh, that, that was a lot of sticks. Yeah, what, what's typical for a year for yourself or other players? I probably go through about 30 mm-hmm. to 40. I know Tommy Hurdle uses a new one every game, so he's probably in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, Pavelski used quite a bit. I think he probably got up to 100 in a year. But uh, when I when I asked our equipment guy after that, he said, you know, that's, that's near the top end. I think some guys, uh, Austin Matthews uses uh, probably close to 150 in a season. So mm. him and Eric were probably close to, to the same. Mm. Well, uh, g- going back to the story that I told my favorite uh, Carlson story, do you know anybody who curses per 60 minutes more than Eric Carlson? Because even in the Penn's introductory video where Eric lines in Pittsburgh, it's on Penn, it's on uh, Pittsburgh Penguins Twitter, and he meets Kyle Dubas and Jason Espeza. He had to be bleeped out in there, too. <laughs> um, I, I think that's just probably hockey talk. I think uh, there's a couple of guys that throw around some cuss words quite a bit, but uh uh, he's definitely, Eric's definitely up there. I mean, it could be with the Swedish and the English. I mean, he speaks English so well though, but, uh, yeah, he's definitely up there. And, um, finally on the, the Eric questions, um, for a lot of Sharks fans, uh, the greatness of Eric Carlson was that 2019 playoff run. Um, Eric pulled his groin in January, then he came back in February, but I don't know if he was ever really quite the same. It seemed like he was on a really hot streak right before that. And then maybe tapered off a little bit. Do you think that had he been fully healthy for the playoffs, that Sharks' outcome might have been a little different or if everybody would have been fully healthy? You never know. I mean, it's that's why it's the Stanley Cup so difficult to win. Um, you, you look at that series against St. Louis, and uh, we had some guys go down. We uh, we got that uh, that goal in game three, the hand pass goal, and then I felt like a bunch of calls, calls went against us the rest of that series. And, you know, it sounds like an excuse, but – um, being on the ice, I, I just felt like uh, it was kind of a, an uphill battle, you know, especially after the the round one game against Vegas where they gave us that five minute major. And um, yeah, so it felt like uh, we were playing against uh, against the refs a little bit there. I know I'll probably get in trouble for, for saying that, even though it was so long ago. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, if you have him healthy, you have Pavs healthy, you have Tommy Hurdle healthy, who knows? We go into St. Louis, maybe win game six and, and bring it back to, to San Jose. But uh, that was a tough one. That was one of those years where, where uh, yeah, you, I, I definitely thought we had the team to, to win it all. And uh, especially the way we were playing uh, some of those games against Colorado, uh, the earlier game, game one against St. Louis, where we were firing on, on all cylinders. So um yeah looking back it's tough it's always tough when you don't win at all especially when you think you have a good enough team to oh statue of limitations here logan uh, uh can you admit now that timo indeed did uh touch that puck with his oh, hand yeah. I mean, he's gone from the team so yeah. you can say oh, that right clearly did and, and <laughs> there was many of us on the ice who saw it and i was right there um if you if you watch the replay again you'll see that a few players actually were kept looking back at the ref and were kind of in disbelief that it wasn't called because it was pretty, pretty clear. Um, I think when I watched the replay, the ref was actually blocked out. So he didn't see it in the corner. Uh, I'm not sure about the other, the, the other three, why they didn't call it, but uh, obviously we, we caught a break there. Do you remember how hurt Eric was during that season or that series at all? Like, did it seem like he uh, was playing on one leg or anything like that or, or hampered at all? I do remember um, the game in Boston. He he left and then came back and then left again. And uh, he, he couldn't move. I think he was just trying to gut it out for a bit. Um, I know he didn't want to leave the game. He wanted to continue to play. Uh, I don't know exactly how bad the injury was. Obviously, it was bad enough where he had to sit out. and um, That's never good. Uh, so I can't remember exactly how bad it was. 
Well, in, in general, though, with that, you know, what did it seem like that injury was worse in February than it was in January oh. then? Because remember, he came back pretty quickly from the from the first one. And anyway, I know that we're kind of focused on this, like this big, like, what if? But I think for Sharks fans, it just it's still on their mind. You know, <laughs> when you think about the entire Eric Carlson tenure with the Sharks. Yeah, I can't remember. Um I just remember the the Boston game. I don't remember mm. anything after that. I do remember the playoffs when uh, when there was a few times where he just didn't look right. I mean, he's mm. such an, an elite skater, and really skating and speed is comes effortless to him. Where other guys like myself, it you kind of I kind of look like I'm laboring sometimes. Him him is just he's so he's he's almost like McDavid like where he just kind of glides on the ice where he doesn't really his his blades don't really chop into it. Mm. He's just kind of skimming the ice when he skates and. I think I remember watching him a few shifts in in that uh, that those playoffs where he looked like he was laboring and and mm. you know he he's not that type of skater so you know obviously something was wrong. Yeah, and well, that's a testament to to Eric and how he gutted it out because he still had 16 points in 19 playoff games uh, that uh, that playoff even playing with kind of on on one leg. But anyway, uh, Logan, just wanted to uh, thank you again for your time and just closing off here. Um, uh, just in general, uh, what do you think about the Sharks' direction? You know, you did an interview with NHL.com yesterday saying that you're still committed to the Sharks, that you're hoping to finish out your contract with them, and we ask you the same question every time someone gets traded. Brent, Timo, and so kind of sorry for that. But uh, specifically in this case, though, uh, what do you think of the Sharks' emphasis on, you know, it seems like they're trading for older prospects, guys like uh, Shakir Mukamadoulin, Henry Thrun. But also, too, though, we saw this with the Eric Carlson trade, that they really seem to be setting up cap space for the 2025-26 season and beyond. And so I don't know how much you talk with Mike Greer about sort of the sort of the big picture plan but you know are you you know are the sharks hoping that that's sort of the the window that hopefully that's the window when you guys are on this clear upward trend the question i can answer is i hope it starts next year i hope we come <laughs> out of the games and have a really good start and force management to to make moves to help us improve sure. at the deadline. that's that's my goal is to give ourselves a chance to make the playoffs and mm-hmm. and go from there um so having said that i i like uh, the prospects of the younger players that they've brought in. I've actually been skating with Shakir. He's out here mm. in San Jose. Um, good player, big reach, good skating stride. Uh, he's going to be a good player. I, I think he's got, he's got an NHL future. So that's exciting to see. And he's, he's young. I mean, I, I got to remind myself some days how young he still is. So he's, he's raw, but the, the skill is there. So that's always good to see. Um, obviously miss, moving a player like Timo hurts because Timo is an elite player in the NHL. But when you get a prospect like him, that shows promise at least early, it's exciting. Um, you know, for me, I, I'll have, I got four years left on this deal. Obviously I would love to, to finish my career in San Jose, but I also want to win, play sure. meaningful hockey games. So uh, like I said, in that interview, I, I can't, tell you what's going to happen you know six months from now a year from now two years from now um you know right now my my focus is having a good start to the year and and going from there i do want to turn this thing around here in san jose i think it would be it would be great to get this organization back in the playoffs uh just because of how incredible it is uh the city just the buzz and in that rank when when playoff hockey is being played in that arena uh, there's just no feeling like it just sitting in the dressing room and listen to the shark head come down um it's almost indescribable. So that's my goal. But uh, my focus is on a, on this upcoming year. And, uh, you know, I speak with uh, Quinny quite often and, and we really want to have a good training camp and, and go from there. All right. Well, uh, finally, Logan, uh, just uh, speaking of the team this year, uh, do you know uh, any of the players that are coming in? Well, you know, what do you think about them? Uh, Mike Hoffman, uh, Mikhail Granlin, uh, uh, Jan Rudda, um, guys like that. I don't know any of them personally. Um, I know Luke Coonan knows Granlin. I think they played together sure. somewhere, whether it was Nashville or, or Minnesota. He said he's a great guy. Um, Chris Tierney had played with Hoffman in Montreal. He really liked him. Um, I think Hurdle knows Ruda. I think he's also Czech. So <laughs> of there's, connections, there's connections with those guys, and I'm sure they're going to gonna fit right in. We've got a nice tight group, uh, good, good locker rooms. So I'm uh, looking forward to, to meeting them when they get out here. All right, that's awesome. Well, uh, Logan, I'm looking forward to the season too. I've uh, been uh, sitting in my room for too long here, so look forward to uh, seeing you uh, in about a month or so. Awesome. Thank you. All right, thank you.